Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you to all of the people who have joined us online and um, out there in television world. Um, I'm Penny Jordan. I'm one of the co-chairs of the School Building Advisory Committee. And uh, this evening um, at the forum, I will uh, give some brief introductions, and then um, Cindy will uh, add to that, and then um, Lisa Sawin from Harriman will be doing a presentation on where we're at with our three options. Uh, Matt Sturgis, uh, our short timer here, um, is going to be giving, uh, providing information on uh, tax implications. Then we'll take public comment. We're asking that people hold uh, questions and comments until Lisa has finished her presentation. Um, so with that, um, thank you for coming here tonight. We've come a long way as a committee, and I will say that each member, uh, the level of commitment that people have had to this work is uh, amazing. Um, and the brain trust we have on this group is also amazing. As I stated, uh, Lisa from Harriman will be giving a presentation on the three options that we are assessing in order to make a determination of how we will move forward and what we will move forward with as a final option. That uh, final option recommendation will be uh, developed at our meeting on May 9th. Uh, tonight, as you uh, ask questions and share your thoughts, um, also, after this evening, there's a survey that's been sent to uh, all of the homes in Cape Elizabeth, as well as many of the rented properties uh, at apartment complexes, et cetera. We hope that people will take the time to answer those surveys and send um, your uh, completed surveys in. They're due uh, either 22nd of April what I wanted to share with you is that as you listen to the presentations tonight, I want to just highlight some of the things that we as a committee consider um, as we go through assessing these options. How does the solution address educational programming and, and reinforce the high-performing schools that we have had in Cape Elizabeth for generations? We constantly look at what's the potential tax impact to households, what it means to our neighbors. We also look at what is the potential lifespan of the elements of each of the solutions. So what is the return on our investment? And we look at what will the disruption be to students. Some of the other things to be aware of that we have been working on, uh, we often get questions as to, are we looking at a comprehensive view of the capital improvements that will be needed in Cape Elizabeth over the next 10 years? And the answer is yes. We've done a lot of work on this. We incorporated the schools into our um, CIP, and we have looked at the various funding options for the many municipal projects that we may have over the next 10 years. And not all of these uh, funding options are, are direct taxpayer. Many of them are grants and other sources of funds which we can use in order to complete those projects. Um, the other thing is that um, as, as we look at what we can do today, and offset the costs as we seek to invest in the schools. So one of the things that we've been doing is, are there things that we can do today to set aside dollars in order to minimize the impact that a major project um, it, on our schools, uh, how might we be able to do that? The other thing that I want people to take away from here, and I'm one of those people that is very, uh, uh, politically active at the state and the national level. 
what we need to be thinking about is what's happening in Cape Elizabeth is happening across the state and actually mm -hmm. across the country because many of the schools were built for the baby boomers and being a baby boomer I can tell you that the high school which I still call the new high school uh, I was in the first graduating class and so that says that school was built a few years ago um, so Think about what we can do individually in order to highlight not just the challenges of Cape Elizabeth and the school infra infrastructure, but for towns across the state. And I think our state senators and representatives need to start looking at actions that need to be taken at the state level. There's gonna be a lot of information covered tonight and you've also received information in the surveys as well as visit our website as well as the many articles in the courier. Don't ever hesitate to send us questions, provide input. I want to assure people that all of those are read um, and we try to re respond um, to each of those emails. Sometimes there might be a time lag but they are read and we do hear everything that you're saying. So again, um, I hope you uh, ask some really good questions, get some, um, provide your input, and uh, you can, uh, I guess, get a feel for what the School Building Advisory Committee does on a almost weekly basis, and hopefully we'll be out of here by 10 o'clock. I hope it's by 10 o'clock, so anyway, I don't like to keep people up too late. Plus, I get to get to everything. Thank you, Penny. I'll keep this short. Um, I'm Cindy Voltz. I'm co-chair, along with Penny, of the School Building Advisory Committee, and I'm a member of the school board. Um, Penny's talked a lot about the work the committee's done already to consider financial impacts, tax impact of the project, and, and the need to understand the life sa lifespan of each solution in order to make the best investment we can in our schools. The committee has also spent a lot of time working to ensure the public will get not only the best return for its investment, but the most value um, for the students and our um, education, educators. Um, through community visioning sessions, a review of a comprehensive educational program for each school, and updates from Harriman's interviews with school administrators and staff, the committees gained an understanding of what improvements are needed to support the students um, to maintain our high-performing schools. Um, we want to meet the educational goals that have been defined and minimize the disruption to students in, in whatever project we choose. The highest priority needs that have been identified are going to be included with every design concept you see tonight. Um, you'll hear more about the additional prioritized needs for the project as Lisa begins her pre presentation, but do know that all concepts include essential repairs for all three schools for the next six years. All concepts include needed security updates for Pond Cove and the middle school, they all address the shared cafetorium issues at Pond Cove in the middle school, and they all address Title IX concerns at the high school. Lisa will provide a lot more detail um, about the additional prioritized needs from the project, and as you listen to tonight's presentation, consider the extent to which each option meets those needs. So thank you all for coming. I'll turn things over to Lisa, and we will have Q&A and public comments following Lisa's presentation. Thank you. Good evening, great to see so many folks here tonight. <clears throat> we're gonna try and be as brief as we can, but there's a lot of information, so we're going to take folks through it. Um, if I seem like I'm rushing at any time, it's not intentional, we're just trying to get through a lot of information. Um, so with that said, um, we will start the presentation. So this is the agenda for tonight. Really, there's four big areas we're talking about. One, we're gonna go, um, over the process, the schedule, and the barriers to education. Some of this might be repeat for those that have been following closely, but we wanna make sure everyone is working off the same um, base knowledge. We'll talk about the design language and the prioritized needs and goals. And this is really what a lot of the options were crafted around. 
And then we'll talk about the three design concepts. Um, we'll get into what are we solving for, what do the options address, what do they not address. We'll also talk about construction duration for each of the options, and we will go over the plans, the scope, and the cost, the long-term planning and the tax impact, as well as the impact to the learning environment and students over the course of the project. And then we will summarize all of that information into some overall um, uh, review slides of the concepts, and then we'll go over the next steps. All right, process overview, schedule, barriers to education. So, Anyone that's been following along knows this has been a very long and intense process. Um, but this is summarizing it really into five uh, main areas. We had data collection, where we were gathering all the information we needed. Then we arrived at seven options to address the prioritized goals and needs. That was um, uh, distilled down to three preferred options. And tonight we are presenting those three preferred options so then we can get the community feedback on those options and then the SBAC can uh, determine which option will be moved forward. Um, and that was what will be called the supported option that will be developed further so that it can be um, uh, estimated and put on a referendum potentially this November. Uh, this is a uh, more detailed view of where we are. So we're at the April 10th Community Forum. Um, between the 10th and the 22nd is when we're collecting feedback. And I say we, it's the SBAC is collecting feedback on the options that you are hearing tonight. Um, and then on May 2nd, they'll gather to start discussing that feedback. And on May 9th, they will vote um, to determine which direction to head. Um, and then from there, we'll understand what our direction is as to what option to develop further and what to emphasize. And then we, from May 22nd all the way to June 27th, we are refining that option um, and getting more detail on that. We will come back to the public on June 13th uh, to present the concept so everyone is aware as to what is in it, what it will cost, and what will be on the referendum. All right, so a quick timeline of the evolution of the elementary and middle school um, buildings. Um, uh, the earliest phases were built in 1934, which was originally the high school and currently used as the middle school. Um, then you can see the 1948 area, which is now part of Pond Cove, originally the cafeteria, kitchen, and classrooms. Um, and then 52, there was another addition as well as 95, or 1955, I apologize, 1960. There was a bunch of areas added on. 1962, 1970, so just a couple years ago, Penny, the high school was built. Um, and then in 1994 was the last major renovation that Pond Cove and the middle school had. So that was 29 years ago. And then um, in 2004, the kindergarten wing was added. That was 20 years ago. And then the high school was built in 1970. It had the pool addition in 99. And it had the administrative and cafeteria additions in 2004. Just a little history on that. Um, many of you may have seen this. This was an ad in the, paper, the local paper. This is what's referred to as the barriers to education. This is a high-level summary of the education specifications that were developed for both the middle school and elementary, really talking about what those barriers are to education. You can see the major headings up here around safety and security, um, inadequate vehicular and pedestrian site circulation, outdated classrooms, limiting edu educational methods, um, the sprawling layout and long travel distances, both through Pond Cove and the elementary, Pond Cove and the middle school, I apologize. Ineffective oversight from the main offices, um, so not having them adjacent to the secure entrances um, and being able to see out onto the site. Uh, limitations at the nurse's office. Uh, deficiency of natural light. Complications from a shared cafeteria, so having the whole population of elementary and middle school using one cafeteria and the scheduling around that and how that impacts the overall schedule and use of that space. Inadequate storage facilities, need for technology upgrades, outdated and inefficient mechanical systems, and inadequate performing arts spaces. 
So um, a recap on the work that has been done um, building off of the educational specification and really getting into um, what we call educational visioning. And what this is, is this is the bridge between the ed spec and the built environment. So it literally helps us understand how do we take the needs and the goals that we heard and how do we translate those into architectural solutions. Um, so there was several workshops that were done um, uh, by about, I want to say there's about 50 or 60 participants, half of them educators, the other half community members. I think we even had five or six students in that group. Um, we arrived at the guiding principles, which are the high level uh, educational and architectural priorities. And then we arrived at the design patterns, which are um, the architectural um, facility solutions. Um, those are the top 12 design patterns, and then those are the guiding principles. And what this chart is trying to show is how those design patterns address those guiding principles. And this is the overall um, uh, design language, as we call it. So these are the big picture art, educational and architectural priorities that you just saw, just in maybe a little bit larger so you can read them. So number one, joy of learning. Number two, warm, safe, and inviting. Three, STEM and art integration. Four, collaboration and connection. Five, flexibility and adaptable learning. Six, school as a community resource. Seven, outdoor nature and connections. And then also we heard over and over again, fiscally responsible. Um, the prioritized design patterns are, there's the top 12, the top six were considered the power patterns, the ones that really rose to the top. Um, you'll hear this a lot tonight, safety and security. Uh, gathering and collaboration hubs, healthy building, outdoor learning and play, agile classrooms, sustainability, flexible learning spaces and furniture, classroom neighborhoods, professional work areas, extended learning areas, breakout spaces and enrichment spaces. So those were the things we just saw on the chart and then there was a forum in the beginning where the community helped us craft the design statement really capturing the essence of Cape Elizabeth and Cape Elizabeth schools um, and also looking at design patterns that spoke to that and from that came the statement, a secure and nurturing community hub that fosters a joy of learning and collaboration by supporting students' discovery of their full potential. So whatever option you end up with at the end of these three needs to speak to this. So we take the educational visioning, we take the barriers to education and we came up with the prioritized needs. And so the prioritized needs are the blue um, heading on the left, and we just wanted to show how the barriers of education fall into those different prioritized needs. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Uh, all this will be on the website. You can reference back to it, but it starts to chart. You can see where they fall into those, um, but those prioritized needs we're gonna go through in more detail here in the next couple slides. So the three con design concepts, what are we solving for, what is addressed, and what is not addressed. We're gonna go over this in pretty detailed uh, next four slides, and then we have some high-level summaries as well. Okay, so the next four slides talk about, in no particular order, option E, C, and B. Um, e is uh, consider called the new middle school option. This is where we are building a new middle school, we are removing the existing middle school. We're doing um, renovations, um, light renovations to the elementary school and a small admin addition to the elementary school. Option C is called a renovation addition option. This is where we do a significant amount of renovation. Um, and you can see the square footages up there. Um, and in addition, that's about 46,000 square feet. Um, that is a cafeteria, kitchen addition, some program spaces, and ad, um, uh, admins for both elementary and middle school. Option B is also a renovation addition option. This has um, renovation of about 36,000 square feet and a, uh, about the same size addition as well. Um, the addition addresses, like C does, the cafeteria and programming spaces and it also has um, the new admin that provides the level of safety and security. So 
We're going to go through what you're going to see on the left hand side are these prioritized needs we talked about. One that was not addressed as a prioritized need, but we has said that it is a high uh, a need that needs to be addressed across all options is repairs. So that's at the top. The repairs from zero to six years are addressed in all of the options, the high school repairs, um, the elementary school repairs, and then at C and B, also the middle school repairs. Um, uh, there's no middle school repairs at E because it's a new school. Um, so you can see those dollar amounts um, that are addressed there. Then we get into efficiency upgrades. Um, the efficiency upgrades um, in the elementary school in option E, and remember this is a light renovation and addition for the elementary school, the energy efficiency HVAC systems um, uh, provides them to the new administration area and the existing library, which require cooling, and new low maintenance flooring at additions and renovations. Um, that's pretty typical across all three options. Um, the difference being in C and B, that is happening at the new admin additions for the elementary school and the middle school. Um, the middle school at E is different because it's a new school, it's going to be addressed in those areas as well. Um, we go down to the second bullet in E where it talks about the middle school. Um, this provides, like we talked about, the energy efficient building systems. Um, but this one, we're able to provide the systems throughout the building um, that, and have them comply with current energy codes. Um, efficient HVAC systems to the admin area, libraries and summer program spaces, um, which is where uh, cooling was prioritized. Incorporates classroom and office um, HVAC systems that increase indoor air quality by supplying air with Display, displacement diffusers, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, radiant floors for efficient heating and new um, low maintenance flooring at the middle school. So displacement ventilation is where we bring the air down in low to the classrooms. We can bring it at a lower temperature, a lower velocity, and then with the radiant slab and the buoyancy and the heat of our bodies, that air will naturally rise up and we'll get all of the air out of the breathing zone, so it makes its, um, uh, the indoor air quality better. Um, this also happens at C and B, but it is in the new spaces. Um, so in the new construction areas, it incorporates those same systems um, as well as addresses the flooring. Um, security improvements. Um, as we stated before, all of the options address security improvements. Um, uh, the similar way they do this across all three is with administration additions at um, the elementary school in E, the elementary school and middle school in C, and the elementary and middle school in B. Um, and the reason that we really focus here on that is because right now the office is separated from the entry. Um, these additions allow the office to be adjacent to the in secure vestibule entry and have vision out to the site so they can see what is happening, they can see things that are coming towards them and they have time to react. Um, and so much better um, oversight um, to that. Um, the difference with E um, is at the new middle school, um, with it being new construction, you're able to do things a little bit differently than you can with existing construction. Here, we're able to provide what we call a more comprehensive approach to safety and security. One of the big things that we can do in this building is separate the public and private areas. So we can separate the classrooms from those areas that are used by the public, um, so, and also be able to uh, close off dif different areas of the school um, more. Um, but that's just because it's, it's new construction. There's a lot happening in all of the other um, options as well, but those are the major differences. Healthy building systems. Um, so this, we talk about the displacement ventilation again here because that is um, definitely a healthy building system and where cooling is provided. We do want to note that cooling, full building cooling is not included at this time um, on any of the options. Cafeteria improvements, um, all three options have a separate cafeteria for elementary and middle school. B and C approach it in a similar fashion to where there's an addition um, in between the two buildings um, where there is a cafeteria access to the elementary school, to the middle school, and then a kitchen in between. 
Um, and then as a result of that, we can take the old cafeteria and renovate that into a place for um, uh, folks to, to gather and have access to the stage and be able to see performances or the band to practice and things like that. In E, um, the new middle school is built. So the middle school has a cafeteria and it has a kitchen, um, now separate from the elementary school. And the elementary school will use the existing cafeteria and kitchen. So we now have those two separate. Moving on to right size functional needs. Um, so this is really looking at making sure we have the right size spaces for the programs as well as we have spaces for a lot of those programs. Um, and this is where there's a lot of difference between all three of them. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go through at a high level um, on each of them. And so at the middle school on option E, um, this meets the classroom and restroom needs. So these are um, full-size classrooms. We have the counts we need for both classrooms and, and the restrooms. It has a high school size gym, um, which is pretty close to the equivalent the middle school gym is right now. It is a high school size um, court with 300 bleacher seats. There's a cafeteria. There's a stage that fits 100 band members. Um, there are performing art spaces that meet the required sizes. Um, we work closely with the, the staff to um, align with that. There is a library STEM space, and there are two two-story classroom wings with right-sized flexible educational spaces. The plan includes area for potential future classrooms and performing art additions. So it's designed to where you can add on in the future if you have that need. In option E, the elementary school, there's limited renovation to add missing program spaces. It does not right-size the kindergarten classrooms. The kindergarten classrooms right now are 20% undersized. They are about 800 square feet. The state looks to have about 1,000 square feet for, for kindergarten spaces. Um, other elementary school classrooms will not be renovated, and um, there are no missing elementary school programs. There just are some undersized programs, and the existing cafetorium will remain as the elementary school cafeteria. At the high school, this does, um, all of these address the Title IX concern in the locker rooms. I'm gonna move over to C. C meets classroom and restroom count needs. It does not address underlying layout and classroom size issues. It provides restroom renovations. The new two-story addition has a cafeteria and kitchen on the first floor with classrooms, offices on the second floor for currently missing program spaces, including special education. Right size, um, it does right size the undersized kindergarten classrooms, and there's a small addition to get the count of classrooms we need at the right size in option C. The majority of the middle school and elementary school classrooms are renovated in this option. The existing shared cafetorium is converted to a 370 plus or minus seat multi-purpose performance space. Um, so what we have done is we've expanded the stage. So every option has a hundred uh, space for a hundred band participants on the stage. Um, and then in the remaining portion of the cafeteria, we have retractable um, uh, performance seats that can come be pulled in and out. So it's a multi-purpose space as well as a divider if you wanna be able to separate that space. Um, the, uh, there is heavy renovation and addition adjacent to the performance space, um, and this relocates the music program from where it is today closer to that existing cafetorium. Um, and it removes that old wing, and it addresses the Title IX concerns at the high school. All right, now on to option B. Um, option B meets the classroom count. Um, the deficit of program space and restrooms remains. Um, it does not address underlying layout and classroom size issues. It provides restroom renovations. It has the same two-story addition with the cafeteria kitchen on the first floor and the classrooms and offices on the second floor, like C did. Um, it does not right-size um, kindergarten classrooms that are currently 20% undersized. Um, limited renovations to accommodate some missing program needs. Current classrooms will not be renovated. The existing shared cafetorium similar to, B, to sorry, C is renovated into that multi-purpose performance space. 
Um, however, there are no renovations to the existing music programs that are currently um, in their existing wing and, and undersized, but it does address the Title IX concerns at the high school as well. All right, that was the longest description of all of them. The rest are going to be shorter. Um, so option, uh, so gathering and collaboration hubs. Um, so those that have been following along, there's been a lot of changes on education since these buildings have been built. There's a lot more collaboration, a lot more gathering, a lot more uh, teamwork, um, as well as uh, communication skills that are being developed. Um, so these spaces um, are needed uh, throughout the school. So at option E, the middle school, the new middle school at option E, the classroom neighborhood gathering and collaboration presentation space. So when we go over that plan, look for how we've set up the neighborhoods and in the center there's a collaboration space um, and it also has what we call a, a community stair for pre presentation space um, so it's a really multi-purpose gathering space there in the elementary school um, there's a, a stem which stands for science technology engineering and math addition adjacent to the elementary school library um, also known as the learning commons and that space is renovated um, there's minor elementary interior improvements for wayfinding and collaboration hubs. So any of the major intersections, we have uh, incorporated natural light as well as finish upgrades and places to pull off with benches and stuff like that for gathering and collaboration. And that's pretty consistent through, through all of them. Um, in option C, we've re um, renovations uh, to accommodate wayfinding and collaboration hubs and we've done a STEM renovation next to the library. And then option B, minor interior improvements for wayfinding and collaboration hubs and a STEM renovation next to the library as well. Agile flexible classrooms. Option E, um, middle school, there are six um, uh, classrooms in each middle school neighborhood. Um, there are in the elementary school, six grade level classrooms in each elementary school neighborhood. And the elementary and middle school classrooms um, have flexibility, um, we have the existing elementary schools, the walls between are not bearing. You have that flexibility to put in operable partitions in the future if you want more flexibility between. The middle school is designed that way too, to avoid having bearing walls in between the classrooms and the hallways. Um, in option C, six grade level classrooms in each elementary neighborhood. Um, with, we've incorporated movable walls between them in option C. Six um, classrooms in each middle school neighborhood um, with movable walls between the fifth grade. When we get to six, seven, and eight, the existing walls, we cannot open up as much. We can open up enough to get a three-foot door in between the spaces for um, people to move back and forth. Um, and option B, um, there are sixth grade level classrooms in the elementary neighborhood. Um, movable walls are not provided in this option. You could put them in later. Um, Option, or in the middle school, there's six, class, there's six classrooms um, and there are no movable walls at the fifth grade or doors in between. Layout modifications, option E, the middle school addresses the middle school sprawl um, that exists today um, and separates the public space from the private space. It sets up a teaming model um, for middle school, which reinforces a sense of community. Um, and in the elementary school, it decreases sprawl with a more centralized admin and entry. Option C does not address most of the sprawling layout of the school, but is improved by the central cafeteria. So you no longer have to travel as far to the cafeteria from certain parts of the school. Um, and it adds and relocates the middle school music program adjacent to the performance area. So cutting down on that um, travel time as well. Um, option B does not address most of the sprawling layout, but again, has that centralized cafeteria improving um, uh, some of the travel distance within, within there as well. Um, outdoor learning and play. Option E, um, the middle school playground, um, which right now is out by Scott Dyer Road, is relocated away from the road and back where we will be putting the middle school in that option. Um, I won't get into too much detail, but there's a grant that's uh, encumbered some of the fields on the site, so we have to be specific about how we relocate some of those. We call them LWCF, which is Land Water Conservation Funds. That field is relocated on the site, um, but there are some sites that are relocated off of the site um, in this option. And then the elementary school maintains its elementary school playgrounds. Um, not on here, but part of out the outdoor aspect is it has addressed um, the uh, bus and, and parent drop-off on the site and all the options as well. 
Option C, cafeteria um, addition adjacent to the courtyard. Um, so that could be, if, if you uh, determine um, you'd like to, you could use that courtyard as outdoor dining. Um, the kindergarten addition is placed to avoid the existing playground area as well. Um, and then in B, um, the cafeteria addition adjacent to the courtyard could also be utilized for outdoor dining. And this is the last detailed slide um, before we get into a little bit more high level stuff here. Um, option E, in regards to minimize disruption to learning. Um, so these were two aspects that we looked at closely throughout the process. They aren't within the prioritized needs, but they were talked about in the ed spec as a, um, something that was very important to address, as well as a lot of talk around long-term planning and making sure what you're doing now, um, we're thinking about how that will be impacted in the future. So minimize disruption to learning. For E, um, this has the least impact to learning of the three concepts. Um, the reason being, when we build the new middle school, we're building that school. It's not impacting the existing school at that time. It's built, now we take the middle school students, we move them over to their new school, and then we have the opportunity to, it, when we're doing stuff in the elementary school, move them over to the middle school side, do the renovations, repairs, move them back and take the middle school down. Um, that will impact about, a th when we say a third of the students, we're thinking the whole student body. So if we think elementary a third, middle school a third, high school a third, um, that's where these fractions come in. So um, minimal to no cost to relocate the th a third of the students in the existing school for 12 months. Overall construction time period is 36 to 42 months. That includes site work after all the buildings are done too. Um, so we'll show you that um, on the slide here in a minute. Option C, impacts learning due to the extent of renovations and additions. Um, and we've, in the total price tag, there's $3.6 million carried um, to relocate two thirds of the students um, during the construction time period. Um, and that is the same for, for option B um, as well. S uh, smaller construction duration, and we'll get into the detail around that um, in a slide in a minute. And then long-term planning. Um, there's several slides on this, um, but just to kind of set the, the framework as we get into the details of the, the plans, um, option E resets the clock on the middle school. So this is one of your three buildings that's resetting the clock. Um, as in all the materials, all the systems are brand new. Um, it sets the site up for complete replacement or major renovation and addition of the elementary school by utilizing new, the new administration addition and maintaining green space, drives, parking, and drop-off layout um, that's established in option E for the elementary school. And future planning allows for right-sized classrooms, collaboration, support spaces, um, and all new public areas and secure entries. This is gonna make a little bit more sense when we get into the diagrams. Um, and then in option C, the cafeteria addition is built in concept C, would be maintained for use, and this is thinking about as we move forward into the future, will be maintained for use by the elementary school if you decide later on to build a new middle school. The middle school addition construction and option C here could be reused for elementary school allied arts. Um, in the future, you could use the, you can continue to use the auditorium um, and the elementary school admin addition constructed in option C could be used in the future by the district or as performance arts support spaces. Um, if you were to do a new future elementary school, um, it could be located where existing middle school was removed or programs could be added to spaces already constructed, and the existing elementary school could be used to house students during construction. The kindergarten addition in this option would most likely be removed if you were to redo the elementary school in a future um, uh, project. And these are all thinking, what if you did this, what if you did this, just things to think about. Um, option B, um, construction of a future new middle school um, would maintain the elementary cafeteria um, for continued use. Uh, the middle school portion could be used as a multi-purpose space. This could be an extra meeting space in the districts. Um, it could be a community space. Continue to use the auditorium and a future new elementary school could, um, would reuse the new spaces um, above. The admin addition constructed in B can be used by the district in the future and a portion of the elementary school classrooms could be repurposed or new classrooms could be built in place of the existing elementary school. Um, an existing elementary school um, could house students during construction of a future elementary school. 
<clears throat> All right, so we talked about um, construction duration. This breaks it down so you can see it in a little bit more detail. Um, starting at the top is option E, then option C, option B. Um, it breaks it down so you can see the duration for option E, uh, 24 to 30 months for building the middle school that includes the demo of the existing. About 15 months for the elementary school, so that's, that's about one, one school year and then a summer. Um, and so that's where the students could be relocated into the existing middle school before it's taken down while you do that month, that work. And then on all of these, there's either six to 12 months of site work after the building part is done. Um, so that's the 33% of student impact, um, and those 33% are impacted for 12 months in option E. C, the middle school work is about 15 to 18 months. This is where the middle school students are relocated. That could either be a building offsite. Um, we could lease a building for them to be at. It could be portables on the, um, somewhere on the campus or somewhere else. Um, we'll get into that level of detail um, in any of the phasing and relocation as we select an option. Um, the elementary school um, work is uh, 15 to 18 months. Um, at that time, we would relocate the elementary school students and the site 6 to 12. Um, so that's how we arrived at 100% of the students are impacted. Each half of those students are impacted for 15 to 18 months um, because you would take those um, in, in uh, sections. And then option B, um, the middle school has about 12 to 15 months of, of work. Elementary, 12 months, six months of site work. Um, and this is where 100% are impacted, um, each 50% for a shorter duration than they were in C. All right. So now we get into the options. Um, so now you have an understanding of the differences between them, what to start to look for. On these slides, there's a high-level summary of what is addressed, what was not addressed, and what's included at the high school. Um, so this is option E, the new middle school. Um, the um, existing elementary school renovates uh, about 19,000 square feet of the building, and it adds about 7,000 square feet. You can see in the diagram, if I can get my little pointer here, that this is Scott Dyer Road right here. This is where the new middle school would be. This is where the, the soccer field is now. This is where the existing elementary school is. That remains. Um, under one of these, <laughs> looks like it got hidden. Right under here is the existing 1934 um, building, which remains as well. Um, the addition for the elementary school is right here. So this is where that new admin addition is. So in lieu of entering over here, you now enter over here. And then the middle school is built here. So this is all the gr dark gray areas are the renovation areas. The green, the dark green is the elementary school addition. And then the yellow is the new middle school of about right now 114,000 plus or minus, and that will get tweaked and refined if you were to go forward with that option. And that, to be said for all of these, these are not exact as we get into it. We will design. This is what we have for each of these options right now to capture the scope. So those numbers will, the square footage numbers will be refined as we get into more detail. Um, elementary and middle school scope, what this addresses. So. Um, Approximately 10 plus or million in essential elementary school repairs. Um, a new elementary secure entry vestibule with administrative offices and nurse area nearby. Um, the new middle school, it demolish, uh, you demolish of existing middle school, construct new in the current soccer field. And the new middle school, as we talked about, resets that clock and provides safety and security, energy efficient building improvements and complies with existing energy codes. Um, it provides that secure entrance, the high school size gymnasium, um, the cafeteria, the stage for the 100 band members, the library STEM space and two two-story classroom wings with right size flexible educational spaces. The minor um, interior improvements to the elementary school are for wayfinding collaboration hubs and limited um, renovation to add missing program spaces. The uh, middle, it addresses the middle school sprawl. It decreases the elementary school sprawl. 
The new middle school performing art spaces meet the required sizes. And the plan includes area for potential future additions and expansions, which I'll point out as we go forward. Um, the STEM edition um, happens next to the library. So in this high level overview, it's right where that marker is. And um, this has the least impact to learning of the three concepts we just went over. What it doesn't address, it does not include elementary restroom renovations. It does not right size the kindergarten classrooms. Other elementary school classrooms will not be renovated. And at this time, full building cooling is not included. At the high school, there are approximately $16 million in essential repairs and addressing the locker room Title IX improvements. So for that scope here, the rough order of magnitude cost is $114.5 million, plus or minus. Um, and there was a question asked if we did not do um, the uh, additions to the elementary school, we just did repairs. Um, what would that look like? If we did a new middle school and repairs at the elementary school and repairs at the high school, um, we would be close to 100 million plus or minus for that. Again, these are all just data points for folks to consider as you're looking at these options and arriving at um, uh, different uh, questions or responses in the survey. Um, this is a blow up of what I just went through. Um, a question that comes up a lot is what happens to the 1934 building? It is retained and turned back to the community in this option. Um, this looks at maintaining the same uh, drive in off of Scott Dyer Road. And then we have our middle school area here for cars and here for buses. And then we have cars here for the elementary school. The additions, um, we will see in just a minute where those are. So this is the existing school. Um, many folks are probably very familiar with this um, at this point, um, but this is the existing elementary school entrance. This is Scott Dyer Road here. Elementary school entrance here, middle school entrance here. This is mostly the middle school program. This is a shared cafeteria space, and then this over here is the elementary school. <clears throat> so those areas that are colored are where the scope of work is happening um, within the elementary school. You can see gathering and collaboration spaces in these light gray um, kitchen work as well as work for um, creating uh, maintenance and boiler areas when we separate the buildings and then uh, minor program renovations as we're moving some programs around. Um, at the middle school, um, there is an elevation change. So as we enter the building, we enter at the main entrance, which is the admin, and that's the second story of those classroom wings. So what you're seeing here is the first level is down um, behind that um, change in elevation. So this is the first level of the um, classroom um, grade areas. This starts to show um, where we have allocated room um, in this area for future classroom additions. So thinking about how we would design this so that we can easily add on if you need them in the future. This is um, the second story of the existing school, um, classrooms, library, allied arts um, in the elementary school and classrooms in the middle school. Um, you can see the 1934 building is retained um, in the elementary school. This orange area here is an addition as well as this area right here. So anything in a red box is an addition and anything colored within the plan is a renovation. This is an admin addition for nurse and admin. Um, and then we have some special education programming as well as the STEM addition here in the library renovations as well as other renovations um, within uh, the school. Um, at the new middle school, um, we can see this is the main entrance right here. Um, so this really looks at uh, having uh, public access to these spaces here with the cafeteria stage and gymnasium. And then we have the admin and nurse here. These are the um, performing arts music band um, uh, spaces. Um, and then uh, consideration uh, in looking at space for a future auditorium addition, if you were to do that in the future, um, uh, positioning that in the site so that can be done if desired. 
library is at the core of the space, and then these are the classroom wings. They're set up very similar. Um, the collaboration space is in the middle um, with uh, what we call educational stair, which is the oversized risers and treads where kids can sit and listen to a presentation and, and gather with their grade level team. There are four communities, one for each grade level. Um, and we have uh, special education and world language spaces in these spaces. Um, and uh, if there were to be a f uh, the flexibility of, let's say, one grade had one, and this is how we've kind of set a lot of these up, if one grade has one less classroom and one needs another, we can flip-flop a world language or SPED to accommodate those classrooms near each other. All right, high school for this option. Um, so 16 um, million in um, repairs and about 500,000, um, again, plus or minus in renovations to address the Title IX um, uh, items in the locker rooms. So long-term planning, um, these are the diagrams um, that we uh, worked with um, folks to put together to show, okay, if you Let's say hypothetically you go forward with E. How does that set you up in the future? So E is um, removing the middle school and we have these two additions uh, here. Um, <clears throat> uh, we talk about what is required in this option um, and looking at um, renovations uh, in the existing, we need to accommodate some renovations for fire barriers um, within the building and that's similar for all of these. Um, this sets up the complete replacement of the elementary school to go where the middle school was. So one option would be if you wanted to replace the middle school in the or the elementary school in the future, you could build a new one here and then have the students stay in here and move over there. That's one option. Um, you can also look at, in time, um, keeping this admin here and replacing the spaces around it. So this could be a multi-story classroom wing with your allied arts and library here, and that would take off the two oldest areas of the building. Um, and then if you wanted to take, let's say, that approach in a certain time period, and then later on replace these areas as they age out, you can do that. So you've replaced these, which are these bubbles you see here, and then you could replace these classroom wings um, the gym and cafeteria at a later stage. So again, just thinking about how you could do that in the future. Um, this essentially is a summary of exactly what I just said. <laughs> so it just highlights the scope that's addressed, the scope that is not addressed, and then we're gonna get into lifespan. And so we have the lifespan here, and there's another slide that's gonna look at the lifespan of all three of these options. Um, and it, it may make a little bit more sense on that slide, but we'll go over it here. So the lifespan, the new middle school um, is, a new building gives you about 60 plus or minus years uh, with a building, um, with some building systems and some material replacement needed around 20 to 40 year mark. Mechanical systems are within the building. Um, so right now, mechanical systems and some of the existing buildings are on the roof. Those age faster. Um, the middle school is designed to have your mechanical inside the building so it lasts longer. Um, the elementary school and option E, um, uh, a new boiler plant is created um, and that is needed because when we take the middle school down, we need a separate boiler plant now for the elementary. Heat recovery units and air handling units being replaced as part of the project. And these repairs will extend the life of most systems by 15 to 20 years with other repair items starting between years seven and 10. And with that, I'm gonna have Matt come up to talk about tax impact on E. <clears throat> thank you, Lisa. Or you can do it from I'll, right there. I can do it, I can do it from right here. <laughs> that, that'll work out great. Uh, thank you for that. I also wanna take the opportunity to thank the Finance Subcommittee, a lot of hard work that uh, the crew and the team have done on that, in addition to Joe Kutara of Moores and Cabot, uh, who did a majority of our finance work uh, for us to give us bond estimates uh, current market conditions and uh, and assisted us greatly in getting to this point uh, on constructing this this nice grid so uh, we'll go through after each of the concepts we'll go through each of the individual um, the property tax impacts for each of them once Lisa gets through describing them all of them have the same base configurations when it comes to making our estimates so they're based on uh, currently 
as everybody's painfully aware, the town's undergone, undergone a full town revaluation. So the median home went to from about 360 to about $700,000 in value. So with that, we've brought forward a forecast of a tax rate of about $11 based on what the town's growth has come to. Now, these are all forecasts based on current conditions. There's, there's any forecast subject to change. Uh, so keep that in mind, please. But this is based on the conditions that we know as of this moment. Uh, additionally, we're looking at uh, a 30-year bond at 3.5% interest, and that's based on the current conditions on municipal bonds that have been recently put out to the market through Joe, uh, Joe Qatar and Morrison Cabot and what he's found for, for uh, what they've been um, yielding. Also, uh, we're also looking at one half of 1% increase annually in the town's tax base. Uh, that's less than it had been in the prior years. However, due to the revaluation and the growth in the overall municipal value, that's why that changes. So if you had $20 million in value and, and the town was at uh, you know, a, a couple billion dollars in value, you're looking at 1%. If you had $20 million and the town is roughly at 400 or, or $4 billion, it goes to one half of 1%. And so that's why we use that as a forecast based on what we did. It's roughly about 18 to $20 million a year in new growth, which is what we have historically been tracking for a long, a long time. Also, it assumes that there's a, overall has been a 4% annual average growth in the tax rate on the town side of it. So uh, that's been, that's been our trend line. We have a couple of hiccups in between, you know, the COVID year where we had hardly any increase and then the years, the past couple of years after COVID and there were some uh, issues that came into that that made it a little bit larger uh, impact. However, overall, our average has been roughly 4% uh, over uh, many years. Uh, these estimates also include the cost for swing space and swing space is really the additional space that you're going to need on certain, on cer certain parts of these projects may have swing space. Uh, property uh, concept E does not have that included because there isn't the need for swing space. And when I say swing space, we're talking portables basically, or, or you may have to rent space to house students someplace else off campus. So those types of uh, expenditures specifically for portables in this case would be uh, included in that debt service as well. And also with all these estimates, you're gonna notice within, on, in the first couple years of debt service that your, your year one, you're gonna see that impact. Year two, it's almost gonna double. That's because what we're looking at are two different years where uh, the town will issue bonds. And so we did use the same estimate for, for interest and term for both of those bond, uh, bond moments. So, um, but we did it in two tranches. Part of that is due to, this isn't a project that gets done in a year. Any of these projects aren't, so they, they will take more than a year or two to do these. Uh, so hopefully, or in theory, you're gonna use half the money in the first part of the project, and in the second half of the project, you're gonna fund that segment of the project. Uh, so, so the additionally, you're looking at trying to feather that in to the impact on the taxpayers. So you won't feel year one, you don't have all the weight of that entirety of the cost of the project come onto your tax bill. So it does kind of ramp that up to finally to where it's fully impacted, so you will see that. But it's gonna be over a two year period of time. So with that being said, uh, I'll get into the, the meat and potatoes of it, but. I just wanted to let you know uh, the foundation from which all these estimates were built. So, uh, and it's all there, we've had it posted on the website, so questions will come to your mind. If they do, please, hopefully this will be a useful resource as you go forward. Pardon me? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, there, I, I got them. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, was about to, I got to multitask a little better. Uh, so. On concept E, so this would be the new construction. As I said, this does not have the impact of the swing space on that, that side of it, but we're looking at, again, a $700,000 home with an $11 tax rate, re ultimately results in about a $7,700 tax bill. That would be for fiscal year 25. Now, for fiscal year 26, which would be a year from now, uh, and this, 
let me just circle back one other thing. It might be 26, it might be 27. So the years that it come, it may have to flex depending upon A, if the project gets approved and B, how the progress goes in, in issuance of bonds. So it may, July 1st is when, is when our fiscal years start. So that may function. So it could, it could slide up or down one year, uh, that's all. I, so, but we're, for cases of this example, we're gonna use FY 25 to 26. So in 2026, or fiscal year 26, that tax bill will go up by, the, you know, now on the left side you'll see base tax. So base tax is gonna be your initial tax and everything in the blue column, and then each year that's gonna go up by 4%. So that's kind of, that's our normal, that's what you would anticipate your, your base tax is gonna be year over year over year. So 4% uh, increase on $7,700 would, would take it to $8,008. When that first year of the bonds go online, that is gonna have a $587 impact to, the, to that $700,000 home. Uh, one great thing about the emails and the input we get from the public, folks look at that and they say, hey, I've got a mortgage. What's this gonna break down to me on a monthly basis? Great question, so we tried to in include that here. So that's $49 a month would be your monthly impact because uh, that's how you know, that's how a lot of folks either escrow their taxes or escrow their bills or they have a mortgage. So that's a good way to, to look at it. But it's about a 7.33% increase. And so overall, your tax bill, instead of it being $8,008 that it normally would be without that, would be $8,595. And then each year from there, okay, then the next year uh, would be fiscal year 27. That would be when the second level of bills or second level of bonds get issued. And that second year, which would basically double what had hit from the prior year, or it's about $1,220 increase from where it was gonna be originally. So from $7,700, it goes up to about $9,500, $9, or about $102 a month, or a 14.65% increase. So you can see how that, that tracks forward uh, going into the next year. Uh, the in interest, and, and the reason why you see a little bit of the, um, why it doesn't, completely correlate into that amount is because the tax bill is still fact, like the total tax bill is factoring in that one half of 1% increase year over year. So what that means is when you're, when you're creating the tax rate, there's two, two numbers that are involved. You've got the top number, which is gonna be the amount that the town needs to raise to pay its bills. And then there's a, you know, it's a big fraction really. And then the bottom number is gonna be the value of the town and those two create your tax rate. So the total tax bill may drop, and you're gonna see in, in year three, it, the impact on the percentage-wise drops a little bit. Well, it drops by about, about a half of one, a little over half of 1% due to that change in value or the growth in the town. So that off, offsets the impact. Uh, but still, you're looking at uh, year three, it's about $102 uh, tax impact, about a 14% change is what you're gonna see year over year. And then finally, by fiscal year 30, that person who started with a tax bill in 25 is gonna have about a $10,600 tax bill at that point in time. So like I said, we've done all of this analysis and evaluation for each of these three concepts. So when we go through the next concept, we'll, we'll circle back to that and do the next concept and, and go over that impact again. I won't do the whole shoot and match of what I just did leading into it so you can understand that. Uh, and then we'll, when we get to the end, we'll circle back and, and talk about all three impacts again. So. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Okay, moving on to option C. So all of that was on option E. Moving into option C, renovation addition. Orient folks again where we're at. We have Scott Dyer Road right here where my cursor is. Um, the existing elementary school is here. The existing middle school is right here. Um, and so on this one, um, we have a renovation of 126,000 square feet. So that dark gray that you're seeing represents all the areas that are renovated. The additions that are occurring are in uh, three locations, I'll call it. So first you have the elementary admin, which is here. 
You have the middle school admin, which is here. And then you have the cafeteria kitchen addition here. And then this is a renovation expansion right here for the um, uh, music programs. What this addresses um, is $16 million um, in essential elementary middle school repairs. It has a new secure entry vestibule with adjacent admin offices and nurse near the elementary school. Um, it has a separate middle school, um, uh, their middle school separated from the elementary school entrance and moved over here. The reason being is so that it's more integrated with the middle school. Right now, the existing entry is here and they walk down to here to the admin and to get into the, uh, to the middle school. Um, so that puts them uh, closer to um, uh, the inner workings of the middle school. Um, and uh, most of the elementary, oh, no, I skipped over a part, I apologize. Um, the new two-story addition with the separate elementary school cafeteria, um, caf middle school, elementary middle school cafeterias and a shared kitchen with classroom and offices on the second floor. So this is a two-story addition right here. And also has um, missing program spaces, including the special ed. Most of the existing elementary middle school um, is to be reconfigured to accommodate wayfinding and collaboration space hubs and missing inadequate program spaces. Um, <clears throat> the existing shared cafeterium or cafetorium is converted into a 370 seat multi-purpose performance space. So that's this area right here. Heavy renovation addition adjacent to the performance area, which is right here to house music programs that are currently undersized and it demolishes, there's a wing right over here, right where the new admin is going that is removed. Um, that was the old uh, career tech area that is now the music program. Um, the STEM renovation next to the elementary school library, so that's happening in this renovation right here. And then there are restroom renovations included and then this does renovate the kindergarten and add this addition to create these as right size kindergarten spaces in option C. Um, it meets um, the classroom and restroom count needs and uh, the current classrooms in the elementary and middle school will be renovated. What it does not address, um, it does not address most of the sprawling layout. Um, some improvements have uh, occurred. Um, one of the improvements with having the cafeteria here um, is that uh, for some the travel distance isn't as far um, to get to that cafeteria, so it's more centralized to the different um, ex um, uh, furthest areas of the school. Um, also in this option, um, the middle school uh, entry helps with that as well, making this more centralized into the middle school. Um, it does not address underlying layout and classroom size issues, so it's not expanding the classrooms other than the, um, than the kindergarten. Um, uh, several of the elementary school ones up here are um, uh, sized to the DOE standards. Others are, are close. Um, the, the smallest um, areas are, are in the middle school, as well as other program spaces. Um, full building cooling and not included at this time. And impacts due to learning, um, imp impacts learning due to extent of renovations and additions, as we talked about in the earlier slides. Um, the high school has the, the same scope as option E with the renovations and the Title IX improvements. The rough order of magnitude um, cost uh, for this um, uh, option is 104.1 million plus or minus. So this zooms you in a little bit more. Um, so the description that I just provided, you can see in a, a little bit closer detail and start to see where these different admins are, where we're removing that perform uh, the, the music wing. This is that two-story cafeteria addition. This is the renovated um, performance area with the music programs. This is the existing floor plan that we showed earlier. Um, again, this is just to orient folks as we go from here. To the next slide, you can see the red boxes are additions, and the areas that are colored are receiving renovation work. Um, so starting with the elementary school um, admin nurse addition, um, the secure um, entrance here is added. This is the cafeteria um, uh, kitchen addition here, and then this is um, uh, the renovated expanded area for the music program. 
Um, it doesn't quite get the band space to the size that it needs to be, but it puts it adjacent to the stage where the whole band could get on here and do their practicing. And then this is that retractable seating area we talked about in that multi-purpose space that we can create when we move the cafeteria out. Um, and then we have renovations throughout uh, the school in the classroom areas, the wayfinding spaces as well. And then on the second floor, this is the existing second story. Um, this option um, uh, re, uh, continues to use the 1934 building um, for program spaces, as you can see um, here. And then this is the second story addition over top of the cafeteria kitchen. Um, having a variety of spaces um, from allied arts, special education, administrative spaces, um, as well as gathering spaces. The high school is the same on C as it was for E. Long-term planning. So looking at this, if, a, if you were to pursue this option going forward, um, this first box shows you the areas that you're adding on to. Um, and uh, we talked about what those are. Um, the um, next box talks about uh, the, what you would do if you wanted to um, uh, go forward with replacing uh, portions of the school over time. So um, one option would be maintain the 1934 building to be repurposed by the town. I don't, you know, this would be years out. Um, maintain the elementary school cafeteria kitchen addition constructed in C. So that's this area right here. And then maintain the middle school cafeteria addition constructed um, in concept C as a multi-purpose space. So that's the furthest part. That would be this area. This would be the cafeteria for uh, the elementary. Um, or that could be a meeting space, a testing space, other program needs that are needed throughout the district. Maintain the auditorium space that was renovated in here and maintain the music um, addition constructed in C for an expanded elementary school allied arts program. So that would be a consideration for reusing all of this as the elementary school if you were to move the middle school and build the middle school on another area on the site. Another um, version of, of this would be um, if you were to build that new middle school and then think about uh, rebuilding um, these wings of the elementary school in time. So just thinking about the natural life cycle of buildings over time and being able to replace them down the road if that were the course of action you want to take. You could keep all of these programs as we talked about for the similar use in this option. Remove these wings here and then build um, uh, two classroom wings um, with support spaces, a new admin, and library on this side where the middle school was um, if you wanted to replace those areas in the future. Similar slide uh, to option E, talking about the scope that it addresses, the scope it doesn't addresses, and then lifespan. Um, for this option, it reuses the existing boiler plant. So the existing boiler plant is in the middle school right now. There are shared systems between the schools. Um, it reuses that um, roo rooftop heat recovery units and air handlers are being replaced as part of the project. The only mechanical system not replaced are the interior air handling units that are indoors in the middle school gym and cafe uh, uh, auditorium area, I apologize. These repairs will extend the life of most systems by about 15 to 20 years with other repairs starting around seven and 10 years. The kindergarten gets new systems due to the addition and new additions would need system slash equipment replacement, that'd be mechanical, electrical, roofing, et cetera, in 20 to 40 years. And back to Matt. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so on this one here, what we're looking at are, uh, once again, the same concepts and foundational work that still exists. Uh, so you're looking with your first year tax bill, uh, base tax of $7,700, and then in year, fiscal year 26, looking at the first of the two bonds. In this case, it would be a $52.05 million bond would be issued, at the, again, at 30 years at a 3.5% interest rate, and that would have an impact that year one of a $534 increase in your taxes. Again, that's roughly $45 per month and about 6.7% of an increase for a total tax bill over the year prior of uh, to $8,542.
year two, you'd issue the second bond. Again, that would be another $52.05 million bond for a total of $104.1 million in total bonded indebtedness. And that would increase your taxes that second year by, uh, uh, again, almost a, a little over twice as much to $1,111 for impact, or the total impact at that point of about 13.34% with a total tax bill of about $9,439. So that would be what a person would be looking at there. And then year over year, it would increase the following year. You've, that, that increase, the, the impact of the increase would lessen due to that growth in the value. So you're seeing your, your, your tax bill is gonna, well, the tax percentage change is gonna be about 12.8% in that third year, 12.3% in that fourth year, and about 11.9% in that fifth year. So your tax bill, starting at about $7,700, would increase to about $10,500 uh, five years out. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. All right, on to option B. So option B is a renovation addition option um, to orient folks on where we're at. We have Scott Dyer Road um, right here. Um, this is the elementary school um, side. This is the middle school side here. Um, this provides a um, new admin addition um, in the front here, um, one side entering for elementary, the other side entering for middle school. Um, the other addition that it provides is that two-story cafeteria kitchen addition, um, similar, similar addition to what you saw in C. Um, and then it has various renovations as well. Um, one um, uh, area very similar is the um, renovation to the cafetorium into that performing arts multipurpose space, as well as uh, various wayfinding um, and collaboration space renovations throughout, um, and other renovations as um, uh, different spaces are uh, moved or accommodated within the building. Um, this option renovates 36,000 square feet, and it adds approximately 36,000 square feet. Um, the, uh, what the elementary and middle school scope addresses is 20 uh, million plus or minus in essential elementary and middle school repa repairs are included. Um, a new secure entry vestibule with adjacent administrative offices and nurse area in approximately the same location as the existing um, main entries, um, <clears throat> but it provides the offices next to those secure vestibules as well as the nurse. Um, the new two-story addition um, with separate elementary, middle school cafeterias and a shared kitchen, again with the classrooms and offices on the second floor um, for uh, missing program spaces um, and uh, special ed programming. Minor interior improvements for wayfinding and collaboration hubs. Um, we talked about the existing shared cafeterium, cafeterium renovations. There is a STEM renovation next to the library, um, and then restroom renovations are included as well. What it does not address, it does not address most of the sprawling layout of the schools, but it is improved by the central cafeteria location, um, similar to C. Um, it does not address underlying um, layout and classroom size issues. It does not um, right size kindergarten classrooms that are currently 20% undersized. Um, there's limited re renovations to accommodate some missing program needs and current classrooms will not be renovated. Uh, there's a deficit of program space and restroom spaces and full building cooling not included at this time. Um, this impacts learning, as we talked about earlier, due to the extents of renovations and additions, um, so I won't get into that detail again, and it has the same scope at the high school as both um, E and B. Um, the uh, rough order of magnitude cost for um, this option is approximately $77.9 million, plus or minus. And here is an enlarged uh, version of what we just uh, looked at uh, for the elementary middle school. Um, so this is that um, admin addition that we talked about, and this is the two-story cafeteria, um, kitchen, and um, educational space um, addition as well. Again, to orient folks, this is the first floor. And then this shows in the red boxes where the additions occur and the colored areas are where the renovations are. Um, so in the addition here, um, one side is the elementary admin with the secure vestibule, the other side is the middle school admin with the secure vestibule. 
you have your cafeteria, uh, cafetorium renovations into that multi-purpose performing art space, um, and various renovations for wayfinding and um, uh, gathering spaces, as well as various um, uh, program space renovations due to the moving around of, of programs when we bring all the admin out here. Um, and then we have this uh, renovation for a STEM program adjacent to the library at the middle school. Um, we've also removed um, a space in the middle here to create gathering space um, in this middle school area. The second level of the existing school uh, this op option also continues to use the 1934 building as part of the school. And then this is the second story addition, similar to what you saw in option C. And then the same scope for the high school as there were um, in option E and C. So long-term planning. Um, you can see similar setup to the other ones um, in the way this reads. The first diagram shows what is happening in this concept. We have the additions in pink. We have re um, renovations needed to accommodate fire barriers within the school. Um, a possible future consideration um, as you start to think about whether it be replacing these buildings or sections of the buildings or renovations over time. Um, this considers if you were to build a new middle school, so you would remove this section here, um, build the new middle school, and then you would, uh, you would, you would create an addition here to have the connector to these um, spaces here. Um, so that's an exterior wall. Um, you would, uh, similar to option C, you would maintain the cafeteria space for the elementary school. This could be a multi-purpose space here. Um, and then another future consideration, if you wanted to remove these wings as um, some of them are very old and others are aging out, we can look similar to the option um, uh, in option C where we build classroom wings. We have our allied arts, because remember this option does not do that addition for the allied arts down here. We have our allied arts and allied arts, for folks that don't know, are your art, your music, um, uh, and, and things like that. And we have our library, we have our um, gem here, stage, and admin and entrance here as well. So similar slide to the others. Um, we imagine people will look back at this PowerPoint and reference as you're uh, thinking about these further. So this gives you the scope that is addressed, the scope that's not addressed, and the lifespan all in one area, the lifespan for option B, it reuses the existing boiler plant. The roof, rooftop heat recovery units are being um, replaced as part of the project. The only mechanical system not replaced is the air handling units that is indoor in the middle school gym um, and auditorium and the rooftop air handling units serving the kitchen wing. The repairs will extend the life of most systems by 15 to 20 years with other repair items starting between years seven and 10. So similar to what we heard on, on C, um, new additions would need systems and equipment replacement, so that's your mechanical, your electrical, and your roofing in 20 to 40 years. And then interior material and other replacements will be needed between years 7 and 10. And back to you, Matt. Thank you, Lisa. So on this final one, uh, what we're looking at, again, with the same base of tax of $7,700, uh, we're looking at two bonds again, one in the first year of $38.95 million, uh, the second one at the same amount for a total of $77.9 million. Uh, the tax impact on year one would be uh, $399 for a total of uh, $33 per month or about 4.99% increase uh, with an increased tax bill on the first year of the debt service to $8,407. And then the second year, if the second bond comes online, uh, that would then increase the total impact of that bonded, that bond, bonded debt, sorry, uh, to an impact of $830 on that tax bill, uh, a little bit over double from the year prior, or $69 a month, and uh, just under 10% of the total increase for the bonded indebtedness for this concept. Uh, that would be a year two tax bill of $9,158. Uh, finally, five years out, uh, you would find that 
uh, your base tax in 2025 or fiscal 25, which was $7,700, would increase to roughly $10,200 five years out. Thank you, Matt. So I'm not going to read through all of this, but this is a good comparison uh, for you to look back on when you want to look at the different options. You have your diagram, you have your costs, you have your student impact, you have what the um, option, this, what the scope is that is addressed and what scope is not addressed. This is a, a detailed description. This and the matrices in the early phases of the, of the PowerPoint, those four slides give you a lot of detail on all of that. Um, this next slide is going to be a really high level summary of that and all it's showing is in these options and we were asked to break this down by middle school and elementary school. This chart does not show high school. We've gone over what the high school scope is. You have your repair work. You have your Title IX work. Um, this shows an option E. Um, what is addressed uh, is the green. If it's partially addressed, um, any uh, any amount of partially addressed, it's, it's hard to get granular with this. It's used to just say, okay, now go look at the detail and the text to get more information, but this is just very high level of what is addressed, what is partially addressed. There are two um, uh, areas uh, that there's some added text. Um, this one here for security improvements. The difference between this and the others is, is this comprehensive approach with the new middle school. Um, and being able to separate the public and private between those. And then down here, the difference um, for the middle school here is because only the fifth grade has the non-bearing walls to where you have that flexibility in the future. Um, the other grade levels at the middle school and the renovations do not. Um, so we just wanted to put those um, uh, disclaimers there so it was clear why those were different. But again, use this as a key to say, okay, there is a difference, let me go find out what it is. I'm back to you, Matt. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, what you find here, is, as, I, as I previewed a bit earlier, was that this, uh, this consolidates all three of the impacts for you to use as a tool going forward. Uh, a couple of big takeaways that you can find from this is when you look at uh, the concepts as they go across the board, uh, option E of the new construction is a $14.5 million bond that's gonna take place uh, you're talking about roughly 57 uh, and a quarter million dollars for two separate bonds. Uh, both of those would be looked at over a 30 year term at three and a half percent. That would be an overall, when you look at your full impact, that's going to be about 14.65 percent is what that's going to have when it's fully bonded on your tax bill. Uh, so that same person again starting at about a $7,700 tax bill will have about a $10,600 tax bill five years out. With option C, uh, that's again, that's a $104.1 million bond. Again, with the two, uh, two different uh, bond issuances, uh, this also includes the swing space, so the, there will be portables needed that will have to be part of that debt service that's included in here as well. Uh, that's part of the cost of doing business for moving students around. Uh, this one here, you're gonna look at when it's all said and done, about a 13.34% increase on your tax bill uh, after both bonds and the swing space uh, debt is all included. So again, that per person is gonna start out with about a $7,700 tax bill uh, prior to the project and five years out about $10,500. And then finally with option B, that's a, again a $77.9 million bond uh, that's going to be issued in two years at about 38.95 million per. Uh, that also includes the bonded indebtedness for the swing space. C and B are the two that need to include that, so that's that's put into that. It's about 2.2 million dollars, I, I believe, is the expense. Uh, that is going to be uh, when it's all said and done, just under a 10 percent increase. 9.97 percent uh, is what you're going to find for the full impact when the that bond indebtedness comes in. Uh, that again, that same uh, property. It's uh, in F. You know, in this year would have a, a seventy-seven hundred dollar tax bill. It's going to five years out be just about ten thousand two hundred dollars. So uh, again, this is all based on our current conditions as we know. And uh, but these are the best estimates that we have. This will be refined as the project advances. When you get down to the last 
uh, the last project and, and you decide which one you want to go forward with, uh, at that point we'll have, we'll work on trying to have a tool that folks can then, when you find out what's going to be moving forward, they can look at that and say, well, this is my assessment, this is what they forecast the tax rate is going to be, and this is what I can anticipate my taxes are going to be going forward. So we're going to try to advance that tool as we get forward, but right now this is, this kind of gives you the larger picture as to what the impacts of all three bills would be. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Okay. Last two slides. Um, so this is the lifespan. We've already gone over it for each option in the earlier tables. We talked about E, we talked about C, and we talked about B. What we wanted to include in this side is, is make sure you can see them side by side, but also give you the background as to um, where we pull this data from. So the National Center for Education T Statistics um, is, um, indicates when a school is 20 to 30 years old, frequent replacement of equipment is needed. Between 30 and 40 years old, the original equipment should have been replaced, including the roof and electrical equipment. After 40 years, a school building begins rapid deterioration, and after 60 years, most schools are abandoned. So this is where we are using these numbers and our lifespan information. So we wanted you to know where that was coming from. Um, something to note, in 20 years, the hydronic piping in Pond Cove and Cape, Middle, and Cape Elizabeth Middle School will be 50 years old. Um, and will need to be considered for replacement. Um, mechanical uh, equipment on the roof degrades quicker, as we talked about, and the mechanical equipment in the building. Um, and air handling units in the building last approximately 30 years and 15 to 20 years on the roof. Um, most existing systems on the building today are on the roof. Uh, a reminder, Pond Cove was built in 1948. It's seven, uh, 76 years old and um, is an average of 54 years old based on its five major renovations and additions over its lifetime. Cape Elizabeth Middle School was built in 1934. It's 90 years old and an average um, of 64 years old with its three major renovations and addition projects over the lifetime of the building. And Cape Elizabeth High School was built in 1970 and is 54 years old and has not received a major renovation, but some systems were replaced in 1994 and over the years. Um, again, a great thing to reference back as you think about um, the information on lifespan. Um, and then working um, with um, folks to chart what that looks like. So we're talking about the different options, and all this does is take the data from that last screen, and it takes the years, and it starts to plot what that means. So for each option, E, we talk about the elementary school. Um, the bond will extend um, portions of that for about 20 years. Um, there'll be some uh, things that need to happen in the first seven to 10 years. Other systems need to be addressed in 15 to 20 years, and other minor renovations over time. Um, the middle school in this option, the new bill gives you 60 years with that building, but understanding, as we just talked about, at the 20 to 40 year mark, life, uh, building uh, materials and systems age, they have to be replaced. So that's what this graph is doing, is just showing you what you can expect with those different options at each of the schools. And with that, we're at next steps. And the next steps are, um, digesting all this information you've been provided tonight, taking it, uh, you have your surveys, um, uh, submitting any questions you have, filling out the surveys, getting information to the SBAC about what, um, what you've heard, what your thoughts are, and then the um, SBAC will vote on one concept to further develop on May 9th. And that is the end of our presentation for tonight. Lisa. Oh yeah, public comment is yeah. next. Yep, we can, uh, public comment or question and answers. If you have questions, um, please step up to the podium over on the other side there and let us know your name and address, please. Hi everybody, uh, Rob Krauser, uh, 30 Rocky Hill Road. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, first of all, I just wanna say thank you to Lisa and Matt and the SBAC, I know y'all, and Chuck and Emily, I know y'all have been putting in a incredible amount of time on all this, and I just wanna say it is very much appreciated. Um, I had more of a comment 
than a question at this point. Um, let's pull up my notes. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. Let's get me in. I mean, my hair looks great today. It's Your hair looks great. It does. <laughs> and as we all know, stakes is high. Um, okay. So in my hand right here is... An insert from the October 23rd, uh, 1993 Cape Courier. It was put together by the school building committee at that time in 1993. If you turn to page three, I know you all can't, but I will. Um, they say that there was an option in 93 to build two new schools, and the cost at that time would have been 16 to $18 million. In today's, in 2024 dollars, that's about $40 million. So two new schools in 93 could have had it for 16 to $18 million. The reason, which also is included on page three of this document, that we couldn't do it is because it was too costly. <clears throat> now... Cape Elizabeth ended up opting for renovations, um, which I believe they spent around $11.7 million instead of 16 to 18 to build two new schools. Those renovations were supposed to last 20 years. We are now here, 30 years later, still talking about two renovation-only options. <laughs> if you look and at the tax impact, which I really appreciate, Matt. I know, I believe, right, there are multiple people that confirmed those tax numbers. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. So for option E, which gives us a new middle school that will last 60-plus uh, years and require no disruption for Cape Elizabeth students, it's $102 per month for a median value home in Cape Elizabeth, which is currently a $700,000 home. If you break that down even more to the daily cost to get that new middle school, which will last us 60 plus years, it's $3.65 per day. Option B, which is the cheapest option and is renovation and addition only, is $69 per month. That breaks down to $2.47 per day. So the difference between repeating past mistakes and doing renovation only, or setting CAPE out on a new path so that the next time in 10 to 20 years when we have to make this decision again, we don't have to make these terrible decisions of which school are we gonna put money towards and what are we gonna do? We will have taken care of that for $1.18. That is the difference we're talking about here. If you're still talking about option E being too costly, you either don't have the facts or you are willfully ignoring them. That is the reality, okay? For $3.65 per day for a median value home in Cape Elizabeth, we can have a new middle school, we can do some repairs at the elementary school, we can do some repairs at the high school, and we can set this town up for the next time, which is inevitable, that eventually we're going to have to replace one of the other schools, we will have taken care of the middle school. We would set ourselves up on a path for that. And I know that there are people in this town who are living paycheck to paycheck. I know that there are people on fixed incomes. There is already, at least for 65 plus year old capers, they can get help from the town's senior tax relief program. So those people can get help if they need help with this tax increase. And if there are other people that need help with this tax increase, then we should come together as a community and figure out a way to help those people. Repeating the problem, over and over again without offering solutions or coming together as a community helps nobody. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.
Al Romano, 4th Burnwood uh, Lane. Um, thanks very much to the committee, Harriman and Chuck. Um, I know how uh, much time and effort has been put into this, how difficult the work is, and appreciate what, what you folks have done. This was, a, an, again, another a very good uh, presentation and, and seeing it mature. It's, 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 it's looking good. Thank you. Um, this is, I just have some simple questions, I think. Um, and this, is, this makes no difference to me on my, how I'm going to um, lean on the, the uh, solution, but I was curious, and this is probably for Dr. Record, um, what the impact is on the cafeteria staffing and the hours um, of, of the, the E option versus the, uh, the B and C. I'm just curious. Um, but more importantly, um, this, these are directed at Matt. The, um, well, the first one's directed at Matt. The graphics with the projected tax increase, those, those are fantastic. Seeing them on page, uh, it was really helpful as the prior uh, speaker uh, mentioned. Um, what I'm curious about is how comfortable we are with that assumption of 3.5% on the bonds. Um, I'm not an expert, but I did take a look at I Googled 30 year bonding and, and I came across a chart that historically looked at, at those bonds. And again, it's not exhaustive and I'm not the expert, but 3.5 might be a little bit low is what I'm thinking. It looks like as of today, the, uh, the, um, the interest on 30 year bonds is somewhere closer to 3.85 or 3.9. So my, my curiosity is, is what does that do to those graphics uh, as far as the percentage uh, impact. Um, I, I'm interested in the magnitude of change that that might drive going up a quarter of a point or, or 0.35. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can speak to that tonight or is that something that requires homework. Um, my other question was, is probably directed at Lisa, um, is the, uh, um, the uh, rough order of magnitude what can you tell me about the magnitude of the plus or minus? Um, it's probably more, more than plus or minus the dollar. I, I, it, but is it in, from a percentage perspective? Because it, it, it could, again, make a difference on those percentages and perception on uh, you know, breaching that 15% increase could, could turn somebody. I don't know um, that it would, but it, it might. So I, th that's the other thing I was curious about. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, folks. Do we want to address those? Sure. If, if you want, before Dr. Record gets up, I can talk about the, just the interest rate. Uh, that was based on what Joe had seen, uh, Joe Guitar from Moores and Cabot had seen throughout the most recent debt issuances that he has. And uh, as I said earlier, it's uh, based on forecasts of what we knew on the ground at the time that estimate was done. By the time we get to issuing it of debt, it could be greater, it could be lesser. Uh, but for the for the example there, um, that's why we use the three and a half. Is based on uh, based on what the town's current uh, credit rating is, and where or what our bond rating is, and uh, where he felt that we would slot. Again, that's you know that's March of uh, March of 2024. By the time we get to that, it could be like I said. It, we could be in an increasing rate environment or, or decreasing, as well as you know one assumption that you place by saying uh, both bonds being at the same rate, uh, that that could also change. So there may be a couple of years in between that it could be higher, it could be lower in the issuance of the second bond too. But we can figure out the the impact of what 0.35 of a percent would also do. I just wouldn't want to do it on the fly now. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we can we can figure that part too, and I think as we get forward, if if there are changes to as as I say as this gets refined, then we can look at that and say, okay, Joe, what are you looking at now? Because we're going, you know, now we're getting to the point that this needs to come with a recommendation to the council and to the school board. What's that number? What's the up to date number today? So we can we can definitely work with that too, Al. Al, could you clarify for me, if you wouldn't mind, just popping back up? Were you talking about the number of employees or their day-to-day? -day? Yeah, the employees and hours. I was just curious because right now um, you've got uh, a, single, a single team in one place service, serving two schools. Uh, under options B and C, 
presumably you still have a single team serving both schools, but under option E, you've got to do one or two things. You've either got to create a new team or you've got to maybe hire ahead, you know, a team leader for the, for the, the new middle school and split the staff that's currently servicing both schools today or something else. I, that's, I, it was just a question that occurred to me as a, as a so I thought I'd, I wrote it down and asked it. That's, uh, like I said, it won't no, be good. That, that's a great question, and I'll do some more homework for our next meeting so I can answer it more thoroughly. Um, but certainly our working conditions, and you were at the tour on Saturday, and I don't think we went through the kitchen. You, you were able to. Um, it's a very difficult working environment. Uh, it makes it difficult on our staff to produce thousands of meals. Um, so I think we'll gain efficiencies with either any of these solutions in terms of providing new kitchens um, for our staff. So I could foresee some potential staffing impact, but I also see gaining efficiency and also produ producing a, a better product. So it's probably a washout, but I, I'm going to do a little more homework. Good question. Thank you. And I'll, I'll address the rough order of magnitude costs. So something to keep in mind are these are three options. Whatever option goes forward could be completely different. Um, so essentially these rough order of magnitudes are taking the conceptual plans. So it's the floor plans, the narratives we've given our cost estimator as to what scope is included. And they're uh, really square foot costs based on different systems. Um, I can't tell you an exact percentage, um, but what I can tell you, the reason we say rough order of magnitude now is because as we go forward, we get a lot more detailed and we can dial that number in um, because there's a lot more detail to work off of. So it's not like a, a huge swing. We're, we're talking, you know, I would say, uh, I don't even want to use a number, but we're not talking, you know, five to 10 million more or less. We're talking within a couple here or there, but again, it depends on how we refine that scope. The, re the reason I think it's important is the, uh, the committee is gonna be asked to choose one of the three options and you're not gonna have the time to, to refine that, if, if I understand correctly. I mean, the, the, the next major refinement is, is when you go to one. So um, the, the three options, as, as the, my, the prior speaker spoke, they're, they're very close together, um, the, the, the impact on tax. And um, if, if, if you, if, I just think, I think it would make, if I was sitting in your, your their chairs, I, I, I'd be curious about, the, mm -hmm. about that. I've got to go with what you've given me, but I don't know what the, the feeling of a max might be on all three. And that's more like what I would want, I'd be interested in comparing. But Yeah, so we'll go back and ask our estimator about what the difference typically is, but it, they're not, it's not a big, a big difference. We just can't say it's exact until we have all the detail. Yeah. Hi, Scott Mazuzan at 270 Fowler Road. Um, thank you all for your time. Lisa, thank you for your professionalism throughout this process. Harriman has produced an incredible amount of work with, with very little time throughout, and I've witnessed that in a lot of meetings, and so thank you. Um, just a couple of quick comments and a question for Lisa. Um, first, Dr. Eckerd, thank you. I was able to take a tour of the elementary and middle schools over the weekend. I have spent a lot of time in the elementary school. It was my first time in most parts of the middle school. It was compelling. I, I feel like it should be required for all voters. Um, but one of the key takeaways for me, um, and I remember this being discussed during the last referendum, um, as it relates to options B and C, not addressing the sprawl in the school buildings. I was talking with Dr. Record and he shared with me that the amount of time our students spend walking from place to place in the school buildings adds up to about two and a half days of instruction per year. And I'll ask him to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but that's two and a half days that we're paying teachers and staff to walk our kids around hallways because the facilities are so sprawling. And we're talking about reinforcing the sprawl with 70 to $80 million of investment. And I find that very compelling. Um, pivoting quickly to the topic of fiscal responsibility, which you identified as a key theme um, from the early ad visioning sessions. Um, 
this graphic with the green lines is the most compelling thing I've seen yet as far as understanding the return on the investment for each of the options. In February, Harriman provided lifespan and expected additional investment costs. Um, the mem the, there are some members of the SBAC who are not comfortable with the inflation assumptions or some of the timing assumptions of those. Um, and so those numbers have since been removed. This is a, a huge step in the right direction. Um, but we still don't know, years seven to 10, major investment needed. What does that mean for voters? And before we narrow our options to one, and before we go to referendum, we need to know if we are going to be asked for another 20, another 50, another $100 million, seven, 10, 20 years from now. We've been asking the SBAC over and over for that information. We've yet to see it. I'm very happy to see this. Um, but we need those dollars, and I think it would be a tragedy if we went down to one option without any of the voters having the chance to understand the magnitude of the major investments that are expected with options B and C. Um, one other quick note, the swing space expense in options B and C, that was mentioned a number of times, but I just want to emphasize we're talking about 3.6 or almost $4 million for vapor, to, to, for trailers, for our kids to sit in for two to three years while we renovate these buildings. There's no return on investment there. It's just the cost of doing business, as Matt said. That's a lot of money. That's almost 5% of the cost of option B. It's a reckless way to spend money um, when we have these other options available to us, especially E for another $30 a month for the average taxpayer. No disruption to the students, a brand new facility with 60 years of expected life. Um, just a really, I find that expense uh, really, really dramatic. Um, and finally, a question for you, Lisa, and this ties into the order of magnitude question from the previous speaker. Um, when it comes to tearing down walls and renovating older facilities. We just had some work done at our house, and I know there were definitely some surprises. Um, when you're in a building like the 1934 building, what sort of expectations do you have for um, unwelcome surprises, and are we gonna start to get into issues with pipes and asbestos and lead um, and all that fun stuff? You already know, as you've said, that we need to be replacing water lines and all that, but um, how much of a risk is that in some of these renovation options? Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's no black and white answer to that. Um, any renovation has risk. We don't, that's why we refer to them as unknowns. We don't know what we'll find. And we don't know the impact cost-wise of that, but there is a risk with any renovation that we do that we will come across unforeseen items and there are contingencies built into all the projects um, and that we would utilize that contingency uh, if we were to find anything that goes beyond that contingency, then we need to start taking from other scope items. So that, that's the risk with renovations. Hi, I'm Jessica Linzer Simpson at 3 Manter Street in Cape Elizabeth. First, I also want to thank you, Lisa. I think the presentation was excellent. Matt, you too. Members of the SBAC, thank you for all the work you've been doing. So Matt, a few days ago, I watched your YouTube video with Clint uh, Sweat on the revaluation, and I took notes. So I want to reiterate, because someone in the audience said to me, how could his chart be right? Because I'm almost paying 10000 in taxes right now, and my new revaluation is around 700000 and he has $7,700 on his chart. So what I said, was the the current re, the current mill rate or tax rate is 22.34 or $2,234 for every 100,000 that your current house is assessed at. What you're saying tonight is with the revaluation since all since the houses have basically doubled you think the mill rate is going to be eleven $1 hundred dollars per a hundred thousand on assessed value, correct? So that person's taxes are probably going to go down. If if her new valuation is seventy-seven hundred and she's almost paying ten, 
she's going down to 7,700. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah if, if you don't mind if I jump in there. Yeah, because that's a revaluation is revenue neutral. So yeah, if your tax rate, if your property goes up by X amount of dollars and tax rate goes down by, by half, then depending upon the percentage of increase of your value versus that drop in the mill rate, then your taxes may go up or it may go down. But in that case, that person would probably see their taxes go down. That's right, yeah. yeah. And the only other thing I wanted to say about the proposals is I also toured the schools, not this go round, but you know, a number of months ago, that sprawl blew my mind. I mean, I moved here 15 years ago, but my kids were already, you know, past school age. So that was my first time in those buildings. And I really do encourage, if you're going to have more tours, that people should go and see what's going on in those buildings. So I do think that the sprawl, you know, it's a little disappointing that one of the options really doesn't address the sprawl. It's... It's a spider web. Those schools were spider webs, if you asked me. You know, it, it was quite shocking. Thank you very much. Hi. I'm Sharilyn Morrison Andrews at 15 Grover Road. Um, before I start, I'd like to start, before I start to share my thoughts, um, I would like to express my gratitude to each and every committee member for your time and dedication to finding a solution regarding the needs for a new school. I know it is a very time-consuming process and definitely not an easy one. Um, I may not agree with some of your decisions, but I do appreciate you. Um, one thing that I don't understand is why this committee is entertaining a $114.5 million school design. At the last election, there was a vote for a similar design, and the town spoke with 62% of the voters voting this proposal down. The survey that you sent out earlier showed that 70% of the people who responded to that survey said that they felt the first design was too costly, would create too high of a tax increase, and that it was too large of a project. So it is back to the drawing board to find a solution for the repairs and necessary needs of our schools. That is your job as committee members, to find a reasonable solution and not entertain a similar design that was already voted against. Why is this $114.5 million, or option E, um, design being considered when we all know that it would raise the taxes around 15%, which has clearly been shown not to be acceptable to a majority of citizens in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I don't much spend much time on social media, but I have seen a couple of comments from people who have recently moved to Cape Elizabeth and are in support of a $114.5 million design. One of these comments berated <clears throat> the retirees of this um, community for not supporting this proposal. I would like to take this opportunity to kindly let that person know it isn't just retired people who do not support this design. I sat in this room when there was an open forum for the first design um, that would, and the talk was raising the taxes 22%. Um, yes, there were people who spoke against this proposal who were retired, but there were also many people from all walks of life sharing their stories of struggles with the rising cost of living and inflation. There was a single parent barely making ends meet and almost in tears because she didn't know how she could afford the tax increase. There was a young couple with young children who had recently moved back to Cape Elizabeth. The husband had grown up in Cape Elizabeth and he wanted to raise his children here. 
he shared that he would have to leave the community because he wouldn't be able to pay, at that time, the extra 22% tax. It is a, it's similar for the couple who are about 10 years from retirement, have lived in the community for 28 years, and their children went through Cape Elizabeth schools. They are earning lower middle class wages and trying to save so they can retire. However, if taxes go up, he shared that this, at this meeting that they would have to move. Also, I would like to remind you that the taxes have recently increased due to reevaluation of the properties, and this too must be taken under consideration. In September of 2022, the Housing Diversity Committee shared the Camion Report. This report was based on households in Cape Elizabeth prior to COVID and does not take into account the escalating prices that have happened since COVID. Prior to COVID, there were approximately 723 households financially challenged to meet housing needs in this community. I wonder what the percentage of financially challenged households there are today in this post-COVID economy in Cape Elizabeth now. If you raise taxes more than the 5 to 10 percent, which will be a huge burden on these financially challenged families, and they have to leave the community, how would you justify this to them? What are you going to say to them? People talk about building affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth, and somehow I find this a huge contradiction. There is a movement to build 200 plus units to bring people of a lower income here to Cape for more diverse population. Cape Elizabeth is considered to be an affluent town, but may I point out that we already have diversity in this town. We have lobstermen, farmers, single parent families, families who are taking care of elderly parents, and families taking care of children with special needs, just to name a few. People who are struggling to make ends meet. Not everyone who lives in Cape Elizabeth lives in a multi-million dollar home. Raising taxes will give households and some of which will give Raising taxes will give households, some of which are long-term members of this community, and some who have recently moved here, no other option but to leave. This makes absolutely no sense to me. <clears throat> Why are we not supporting established members of our community rather than driving people away? Again, why are you entertaining a design that would raise taxes around 15%? If we have any extra money in the budget, I believe that it should go to the teachers' salaries and for room supplies, not for a new building with lots of bells and whistles. Finally, I would like to remind you that on the survey, 51% supported a 5 to 10% increase on taxes. Only 38% supported a 10 to 5, 15% increase. I encourage you to strongly consider option B design. Option B would raise taxes 10% in two steps, 5% one year and 5% the following year. Option B address, addresses the essential needs of repairs and a few additional needs that would make the classrooms, cafeteria, and performance spaces more functional. Moving forward, I can only hope that Money will be budgeted and saved each year for future renovations. May we learn from past mistakes and be better prepared for the next time. Thank you for your time. Could I say something? Yes. I just want to say thank you so much for um, taking the time to write all of that and express uh, thoughts from your heart. Uh, I. 
I just, I just want to say that what you're saying there, the committee takes very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, the $114 million option mm -hmm. um, is not identical to the last project. I understand it, It's that. different. But at various points throughout the project, that, that uh, particular option has varied and we've tried to kind of dismantle it, take it apart, just to see if we could in some way take some sort of leap without uh, impacting uh, taxpayer households. And I, I truly think at the household level because I'm one of those farmers you mentioned mm -hmm. and uh, I know how tax burdened I am. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I just want, I, I just have to say that everything that you said is something the committee talks about and works with and, and understands. And one of the things that, um, a couple of items that I'm working on are ways that we can help mitigate any tax impacts to the people that you mentioned right. who are, are really burdened from an expense perspective and trying to stay in their households. Because mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer Cape Elizabeth is not a gated community. Cape Elizabeth is a diverse community and we're going to keep it that way. So uh, I just, I, I'm just in awe of what you wrote. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it. Good evening. My name is Becky Fernald, 313 Mitchell Road. Um, and again, I, I, like everyone else, I want to thank the incredibly hard work all of you have done, the building committee, and um, excellent presentation today. Lisa, thank you so much from you and, and your firm. Um, it makes it much easier to figure out the different options in the comparison. Um, I just have a couple questions. Um, one is, in a prior presentation, I heard... Um, Somebody asked if there had been, if, if the town or the school had applied for state aid for this project, for the building project, since there is, um, you know, there, there is money for, from the state for districts who are building new schools or renovating. So I just wanted to know, and I, I don't know who could answer that question, if, if there has been an application and where are we in that process? Um, nice to see you, actually. Um, so the application process had closed previously, um, and CAPE hadn't previously applied. I, I wasn't here at the time. Um, but there were uh, over 70 school districts that made the list for their schools. Um, of those 70 plus, nine projects were funded. Um, so that is the challenge I think we were mentioning earlier. The state is in a difficult situation because um, there are schools in nearly every community that need help. Um, so that application process closed. It's now reopening um, beginning in August. Uh, we've already started talking about um, applying to get on the list. Um, that's a long process. Um, once the state gets the applications, they send teams to each community, they evaluate each school, then they determine how many schools are on the list and they rank them. Um, and talking to Scott Brown of the main DOE, he thinks it's probably a 10 year, uh, 10 years from this summer to when uh, you know, a school could p potentially be built. And they don't build them all at once. It's usually one, as you know, but as usually build one or two schools uh, a year through that process. So um, we will aim for that uh, and we will pursue any avenues we can to bring in state funding. Okay, all right, well, thank you. And I had another question, probably Lisa, maybe this is something you might be more familiar with, but the, um, I just wanted to know about the energy efficiency um, considerations of both the renovation proposals and the new middle school. So if, maybe it's just, if in a new middle school design, what would the, um, the heating system be? Is that still based on oil or is, that, is it something different? Um, 
now thinking of what the AC option was we were considering. Um, let me get back to you on what the option is, and I can provide detail for the website on what that is. Um, but the system, they're efficient systems. Any of the new systems are more efficient than the others. Um, in the new build, whether it be the middle school or any of the additions, the envelope has much more energy efficiency to it than the existing schools from an insulation standpoint. Um, so there'll be uh, a lot addressed in regards to that, as well as um, looking at incorporating daylighting as well. Right. And um, I'm just looking at long term, because if you have more energy efficient systems, that can generate a lot of savings in the mm -hmm. future. Yeah, and that's um, something as we go forward, we'll get into the detail of the system of whatever option you move forward with, what those savings are. We've started to align like the new the additions, there's um, uh, some of the areas have, you know, the VRF or they have the, uh, the displacement ventilation we talked about for air heating in the radiance labs. Um, we started to align that with energy uh, efficiency main incentives mm -hmm. so we can see what systems will give you different paybacks um, for that as well. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tom Dunham, 11 Becky's Cove Lane. Um, I had a couple of meetings today on construction costs, and I'm just overwhelmed at <clears throat> the increases. And so my question tonight is on your estimates, how comfortable are you with those? Mm -hmm. And we're really talking two and three years out, mm -hmm. and I would think it would be very difficult to um, pin those numbers down mm -hmm. today. And for example, on an industrial building, talking to a contractor today, today um, two years ago, maybe three, it would be $150 a square foot. Now it's well over 200. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at your labor costs for the um, various uh, HVAC contractors, anybody in the industry, it, it, it is just, oh, it's unbelievable. And so how, I'm just asking, how, how Comfortable are you in these estimates, and um, and what are the what's the contingency? Because mm -hmm. the increases are significant today, and I don't think it's going to change. Mm -hmm. All good, all good questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball, uh, but we work off of historic information. Um, we have tracked uh, so the uh, Turner Index had projected, you know, the escalation rates and about. Uh, 2017, we started to see it deviate drastically. And I wish I had the chart with me. I could show you and you, you, you're aware of the difference that has occurred. Um, we look at that. We look at the historic bids. We look at current bids. We look at understanding what the escalation is. We work with an estimator who works in school construction in the state. For any of these size projects, there's only a handful of people that will build them that have the experience with school construction. So we understand um, who the contractors are. We understand what we're seeing for escalation on other projects. There's escalation carried per year from today to when that project would bid. And then there are contingencies that are built in both on bid and construction on top of that. So we've looked at it. Harriman's internal staff has looked at it. Our independent cost estimator has looked at it. Turner has looked at it as well with their, in, their internal um, estimating teams. We've had um, a comparison between the two estimators and talked about it at length to where we all got comfortable with what that escalation and those contingencies were. So I feel, as, as I feel confident in the numbers. Again, we don't have a crystal ball, but we feel confident based on the historical information and data we have at hand. Looking um, two or three years out, what was the annual annual escalator? What was the what? Been, annual escalator? Annual escalator that you've been um, We went back and forth on this. Do you remember, was it 8%, 6 or 8% per year? Per year on that? So from today's dollars, uh, it's, with all of the add-ons and everything else, there was... Uh, and contingency and everything else, there's quite a bit of markup on all those numbers, but escalation itself was around the 6 to 8% per year on that. From my experience, at least. Oh, yeah, well, 
in some areas. So tracking the history right now, some of those areas are leveling out, some are continuing, and some are dropping. So you have to look at all of them. Certain building types, yes, they're seeing certain things, but they're looking at all those different things. So um, with all that and other contingencies, design contingency as well is another one I didn't mark, I didn't mention. From where we are today to a final design, we have to carry a design contingency too as well. So that's in there. Chuck, did you want to comment on that? Are you good? Okay. Hey, Elizabeth Fairman, 19 Trendy Road. Um, again, I mean, everyone already said it. I won't take a lot of time, but thank you, truly, for the amount of work and the hours you all have put in. Um, I've heard people on the SBAC say that their worst case scenario is that we do nothing, and I just, I think it's, for me, I don't see that as the worst case scenario right now. I think investing an incredible sum of money, the most money that Cape Elizabeth has invested in its schools in a short term solution, even if it has the upfront lowest tax impact, is the worst case scenario for me. Um, and you know, I did not, <laughs> I didn't coordinate with anyone, but I also had looked at the 1993 insert to the Cape Courier that the SBAC put out um, when they did the last big renovation, and there were three options, minimum necessary renovations to eight, for eight to nine million dollars, um, mix of new construction and renovation for 11.7 million dollars, and a new pond cove and a new middle school for 16 to 18 million dollars. And what the article said is that the focus of the committee was on developing a, quote, no frills plan to keep the cost to taxpayers as low as possible. I understand that, and I understand that increasing taxes has a meaningful impact on a lot of people in the community. However, you can't get something for nothing, and the bill eventually does come due. We do need to make a substantial investment, no matter how you look at it, and so I think instead of just focusing on the, the lowest possible impact to taxpayers up front, if we can look at the best long-term value for taxpayers over the next 10, 15, 30, 50 years, that is function, that is to me fiscal responsibility. That is really lessening the impact over time as much as possible, even if this initial bump is higher than, um, the absolute lowest possible minimum that we can get away with. Um, and, and I think it would be helpful for me, um, this is for my last comment, if there was a way to present the adjusted tax sort of mill rate information, if our taxes uh, change under options B, C, and E, as compared to um, the mill rates or tax rates in other towns to give a sort of apples to apples comparison of, of if, if we have one of those options, how do we compare uh, affordability wise for taxes to other towns? Thanks. Lisa, one other item, I, I neglected to bring this up and uh, there is assistance for seniors and that current program does exist, property tax assistance program for seniors, so it's long time residents or over 10 years uh, that's funded by the town with an annual uh, application process. Uh, it's based on revenue or what a person's income is on an annual basis. So there is tax relief that the town funds on an annual basis up to $500 in the most recent. Uh, that council will be taking that up as well during the budget process. So there's conversation about expanding that benefit as well as, uh, you know, as far as the ability to or the level of qualification by what your, rev what your income is as well as what that benefit's gonna be. So uh, some folks may be confused or thought, think that uh, the state had a program that froze your taxes uh, that they repealed this past year. Uh, they're two different, they're apples and oranges. One's a program that's run here locally. The other is a, the tax freeze program that was, everybody has it, well, those who qualified, sorry, Nicole, <laughs> have it currently on there, uh, uh, who qualified have it. But the legislature pulled that one back, so next year that, that program won't be in place. But the, uh, but the local property tax assistance program for, assistance for seniors will be there. So 
stay tuned for future updates when it comes to that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Um, Nicole Boucher, 14 Grover Road. I'm always leery when people speak on behalf of others, especially groups for which they don't belong. So I am speaking only to my personal and professional experiences, including sitting at the town council as finance chair, being a parent of a special needs student who will not benefit directly from this project, a daughter who is currently housing her disabled parents who could not afford housing of any kind in this area. And I am in favor of moving option E forward. I do not like to waste my money. We have an opportunity here to embrace good municipal planning, to reset the clock, to create a master plan for the entire campus. It's the most fiscally responsible action. I agree with the previous speaker that to invest 80, 60, 90 million dollars, 110 million dollars into the current buildings to extend the life of something that is already flawed is not a good use of money and I would rather see nothing happen. Resetting the clock on one building may mean that we have to push off non-critical needs at other schools for a few years, like the kindergarten being 20% smaller than it should be. That's compromise. Two new buildings was the old proposal. We're down to one new building and creating a comprehensive plan to address all of the all of the issues as debt expires. I have lived here 14 years, and I will live here 40 more. I do not want to pay for the same problems twice. Parents have already had kids impacted to learning loss due to the pandemic. To put them through years, two to three years of renovation, I can't see one parent who would agree to that. And if you don't have the parents on board with changes to the school, who do you even have? I have a question for Matt as well. Similar to a previous speaker, I am curious about the assumptions about the finances, but not the 3.5% rate. I'm curious about why we are using 30-year bonds when only one of these solutions will still be in place in 30 years. We're using a 30-year bond, which means if options B and C need replacements and major repairs and significant investments in 20 years, we are still paying off the loan on the renovation when we need to do another renovation. That doesn't seem like good sense to me. Thank you, uh, Ms. Boucher, for your question on that. I'm so happy you asked that. Part of the conversation, the Finance Committee uh, looked at this, and it's in this case, Part A is because we want to compare apples and apples. So you wouldn't have uh, different levels of debt service that would be in there. So we've tried to have them all on the same level playing field so they're all at a 30-year bond. Uh, the other thought is that uh, those bonds would be refundable at 10 years, meaning that you could refinance. So if the market conditions are better at that point in time and you find that uh, you have that flexibility to either take advantage of better bonding situation or uh, you may find you have to do something else, uh, another part of the project, so you would refund it. You could look at that and say, okay, we need additional money to do some other type of work. So uh, that was part of the discussion as well. But we tried to make sure that the debt service or the debt service for each of those projects would be kind of based on the same footprint. Uh, you may find that uh, depending upon which of the options that are selected as this goes forward, you could look at that and say, well, it makes sense to do a 20-year bond if it was the renovation work, or it may be 30 with the concept of refunding or refinancing at the 10-year window. So that's kind of why that, uh, those elements were kept uh, in place at that point in time. Uh, we do have a hand from Megan raised online, so I'd like to bring Megan in, if I may. And I think your microphone should be live. Hello, good evening. Um, good evening. I'm assuming everyone can hear me? Yes, perfect. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the committee um, for the work that they've done in putting these options forward. There's been a lot of um, excellent points made in terms of the financial impact that building a new school will have on the town, um, with some people expressing um, you know, fears and concerns around negative impact and other people understanding the um, long-term benefits of investing in a school. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take a step back and start from the position of a budget reflects your values. 
as a new, relatively new, or actually new resident to Cape Elizabeth, um, one of the things that I've seen consistently is pride in the Cape Elizabeth schools, pride in the students, pride in the teachers, the administration, and the town's involvement in the schools. What is a significant disconnect for me is this pride coupled with this un seeming unwillingness by certain parts of the town to invest in the youngest members of our community. This goes beyond a financial question or consideration. This goes into what is it that we value? What is it that we budget for? And what is it that we plan for? The children that attend these schools are unable to vote. They're unable to speak at these forums, but they do go to these schools every day, along with our administrators, our staff, and our teachers. The state of the schools is, frankly, deplorable. Um, having come from a town that recently went through the process of building new schools and spending close to seven years over the process, what ended up happening was a uh, revisiting, re, you know, testing, looking at this, you know, plot of land, that plot of land, and money just kept getting spent over and over again. The school ended up being built. It cost more than what was originally scoped and was less than what was originally scoped. So what I would encourage everyone to do is to, and I do recognize that everyone has a range of financial realities that they're living with, but to take a step back and look at what kind of town Cape Elizabeth is. Is this a town that invests in the future, invests in the young people, the teachers, the administrators, and the staff that work in these schools? And are we willing to align our financial investment with our values and I strongly believe that this investment made at this time in a new school is going to benefit the town uh, far more than the calculations and the you know tax impacts and the, the you know sort of the you know cafeteria staffing type discussions that we're having today. It will be a point of pride. It will be something that the town can rally around and look at something that they've created together. It will be something that will stand as a testament of how Cape Elizabeth feels about itself as a town, how they invest in their young people, and how they value education. Currently, that, uh, st you know, the statistic around uh, two days walking through schools um, was astonishing. That was one I hadn't heard before. These schools have long passed their date of expiry. None of us would walk into these buildings and say, yep, this looks great. This is absolutely you know, acceptable and uh, is something that will serve us well for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. I encourage all of us to think about what we want for the young people of our town and what we want and how that will reflect our values. I do want to acknowledge one thing, though. While I do say that the schools are um, in significant need of repair, and I do want to acknowledge the significant risks with repairing old buildings, I also want to thank the um, staff, the custodial staff, and everyone that works in those buildings for making them as welcoming and warm as they are. They are animated by the people that are in the buildings. Let's make the buildings match the people that are in there every day. Thank you for the time and consideration, and I strongly support building a new school. Option E is the best option on the table. However, I would support building all new schools. I absolutely will not vote for a, any option that puts children in temporary housing or temporary schools, um, given what they've been through with COVID and also the lack of return on those uh, other options. Thank you for your time. Next, we have uh, we have a couple more folks online. If we could do that, uh, and then we'll come come back to life. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Gail Darling. Gail, your microphone should now be live. Thank you. Um, I appreciate very much the tax estimated tax impact slide, and I just want to make sure I understand this. It appears to me that if I look at the tax burden on this typical $700,000 house five years out, that the difference in tax between the most expensive option and the least expensive option is $390. Is that correct? 
Uh, yes, that is correct. I think it's somewhat um, not misleading, but concerning when you look at the percent tax change because they sound like such big numbers. But when you actually look at the number of, of the dollars you're going to pay for the least expensive versus the more expensive, $390 doesn't sound to me like it's an impossibility for most people in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, last we have Jen Bodenrader and Ms. Bodenrader should, your microphone should now be live. Thank you. I'm Jen Bodenrader, Brentwood Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I really would be so happy if more of our community saw this as a legacy investment um, that we could come together around. As the last speaker mentioned, the difference between um, B, which has our children highly disrupted for years and kind of puts together a building past the end of its life that, that will only extend the life of the building 15 years to 20 years and a brand new building that will last 60 years. That's, that's a difference of $1.13 a day. So you're gonna have a 30 year bond with B and C to invest all this money in buildings to get you 15 to 20 more years instead of building a middle school that will get you 60 years, that will go 30 years past your investment in the bond. I really don't know why we don't have more information about what is the financial investment, medium term and long term? All that I see available is immediate investment. So if options B and option C require additional repairs in seven or eight years, and then very large investments in 15 and 20 years, where is, where is that information? Um, there, it also does not include the investment of renting trailers or whatever we need to rent that cannot be bonded that will also impact taxes. So I do feel like we're missing some really important financial information. <clears throat> I would really like to know what the total cost is of all these options over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It's how you make a wise decision. Um, my other concern is that with options B and C, you set the town up to be in exactly the same place in 15 to 20 years with three buildings with significant needs at the same time. Uh, and you know, a, a prior person had mentioned learning from mistakes. And I really think we need to learn from, from our mistakes. And that is not the way to plan ahead for a muni municipality. So my feeling is that at least getting a middle school, a new middle school building that lasts long term is the best compromise, the wisest decisions. I do think we fail the town if we do less than that. I think it's a, a poor investment, but I do beg for more information, please, on return on investment, medium term, medium term finances and long term finances. And I would like to ask Lisa to please, if she could tell us about the return, because I know she's investigated this, but doesn't have it in the materials. What is the return on investment for these three options, please, in the medium and long term? Thank you all so much. And that's all we have online at the moment. Ms. Sanders, if you don't know if you'd like to jump up. Yes, I just have a question about concept E and building the uh, new school on the soccer field. And something was briefly mentioned that it was developed with originally with a federal grant. Mm -hmm. And so what does that entail? That was kind of. Yeah, so um, I'll speak in detail about that. Um, 
forget what time period it was, but probably in the 1970s or so, a lot of um, schools and municipalities took grants to build athletic facilities across their campus. There's a bunch on this campus. Mm -hmm. And with taking that money, you have committed to maintaining that use forever. But there are some things you can do. You can relocate that same use. So that's what we're doing, we're relocating that same use on the same property. And the same with the playground is also part of a grant. We are relocating that on the property. Same use, just a different location. So where would that be relocated to? In so, so the soccer field, uh, right now the soccer field gets relocated to um, right as you drive in from Scott Dyer Road, that green space, that field there, the soccer field goes there. The playground moves over to where the middle school is because it's a middle school playground. And then the athletic fields that are there will be relocated to another place off of the campus. The dollar amount is covered in the cost. We would have to work through the details of where those locations would be. So off of the campus, would it be with them walking distance for the for the school students or would we have to transport them uh, again to be determined we would have to locate them off off the campus that would be a detail that would have to be worked out if you move forward with that option um, i know there was different uh, considerations that are being looked at but i don't have an answer as to exactly where they would go and it's the two right as you drive in i forget what the use is of those baseball middle school baseball, middle school baseball. In a play field. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, can you hear me? Um, Eliza Matheson, 270 Fowler Road. Um, thank you all so much. I have been following along from the beginning. You've all heard from me a lot. You probably see me a lot. Um, Matt, I had a, just two questions for you really quickly. Um, if our, if we I know they're all on 30-year bonds um, currently, but if we do some of the other ones down to 20-year bonds or lower, does our monthly cost go up? Yes. Can you say that again? <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry, I had a, a frog in my throat. Yes, it would, because you'd be, it'd be a shorter term, probably very similar uh, percentage rate you'd be paying, right. but your but your monthly debt service or your annual debt service would be greater because you have a shorter term. So okay. Same number. So if we went down to a shorter term, the payment would go up. Yeah, or, much like if you were buying a just car, like any you went kind from of, a six month, uh, yeah. like a 72 month payment to a 60 month payment, yeah. you're gonna pay more for this five year versus the six year. I've been in that position before. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, I just wanted to clear that up. Um, also, can, do you have any sense of what our relative tax rate is compared to other tax rates in Cumberland County? Oh, um, Kinda. Kinda. Uh, yeah, kinda. Because um, it depends upon which which towns are in the process of revaluation. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. Right. Uh, effectively, our tax rate is lower than most. Lower than when, most. When, when I say effectively, what I mean is, when you take what um, their ratio is, and I'm gonna geek out for a second. Go for it. Please excuse me. Uh, so when you when you look at what a town's uh, tax rate is, if you know what their relationship is between their assessed values and market values, you multiply that percentage by their tax rate and that gives you what their effective tax rate. So okay. if, a, if a town's at, like Cape's at 22.34 is our tax rate this year, yep. but we're at about 50% uh, ratio, our effective tax rate is about 11. Okay. And miraculously, you get a revaluation done, we're gonna be quite pretty much close to that range as well coming out of right. it. So that's, so if you look at that, uh, I've looked at a couple different towns, uh, Yarmouth and Cumberland. Cumberland's about to do a, a reval uh, as well. Uh, yep. Somewhat familiar with that because I'm going there in a month, but looked at it before, <laughs> before that all happens. They're, they're all in those, uh, they're in that 11 to $13 range, uh, okay. maybe 14 in summers. Scarborough's a little bit higher, uh, but it's it's a more expensive community. South Portland, the same. South Portland, you more you more your larger communities are going to have a little bit higher higher rate. But as far as your comparable communities, we're on the lower end. On the lower end. Yeah. Okay. Um, my comments um, for the public forum are not unlike a lot of comments I've shared, um, but knowing that this will likely be. 
for a larger audience. I just wanted to share them again. Um, I, uh, n when I came home from the hospital, I was brought home to Fowler Road. I currently live on Fowler Road. Um, I, um, I have lived here for uh, 32 of my 40 years, so not forever. I, I did go to school out of state and lived out of state for a little while, but I did come home, um, and my mother is very thankful for that. Um, I did um, preschool in the high school, when there was a preschool in the high school, um, and then I did K through 12 in Cape. So I, um, I consider myself um, a, a caper through and through. I moved back here hoping to live here forever, and I, I do plan on it, much like one of the previous speakers. So um, I have a, a deep, committed um, affinity for this town. I, I love it to my core, um, for better or for worse. Sometimes I think maybe yeah, um, a little too intensely sometimes uh, for my own good. Um, but I have always carried a lot of Cape Pride. Um, I mean, I did get the School Spirit Award in high school, so <laughs> it's on a plaque. Um, and what I have found, I, I actually was in the 1994 renovation. I was in a portable um, with uh, Barbara Powers, who's my teacher. Um, and I have a, I have two students in the schools right now. Um, I remember the vote that got voted down in 93. Um, and what I see right now is an opportunity, an opportunity for our community to plan better, to do better, to get over the, f the failed planning of the past and leave it behind us and start with a true comprehensive plan going forward that sets us all up for success. That is talking about low, the lowest income in our community, which includes my family members. We are talking about the middle income and high income members of our community, the students who require and deserve the best education we can give them, our staff who are phenomenal, who I see almost every single day um, as I work in the schools and volunteer, volunteer frequently, um, and our town, which prides itself on our schools, and in case anybody forgets, is almost the entire reason people move here, um, literally. <laughs> when people move here, they say, I moved here for the schools. And then, when you talk to people, they say, I had no idea the schools looked like this. And I don't think people realize that we have gotten to this point where we have let, we have let our kind of, our frugal, low tax, keep it, the, fr the frills low, as low as we can, we've let it blind us. And it is absolutely coming to the last point. <laughs> where we can not do this anymore. Um, my children have had leaks in their classrooms. They've had bathrooms out of order. They've had um, classmates who have had to move classrooms entirely for significant portions of the year. We're already talking about learning disruption. We don't need renovations that are gonna disrupt them for more years. I don't even know if my kids are gonna benefit from the middle school, given their ages. Um, but I do know it's worth the investment um, because I know that there are kids coming up through it. Um, and just like I hope maybe my kids will maybe have kids and come back, maybe their kids will see it. Um, so I just, I, I don't have any new facts to add to this. I don't have any new information. Lisa and her team are powerhouses. Like this needs assessment was far more comprehensive than anything I had ever expected to see. And seeing those needs played out, like on paper, and oh my gosh, I don't know how you fit all that information on those pages again and again and again. Every time we ask you to put more information on the pages, you do it. I just, I don't know how many different ways we can say, the bill is due, it is time, the costs keep going up. The costs will keep going up. We've already seen it happen time and time again. 
So now is that the actual time to do it and plan strategically for the next investment and get our town on a good track. I don't have anything like more important to add, um, except, I don't know. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. No more hands online. Any other public comment? All right, I think that's a wrap. Back to you, Cindy and Penny. Yeah. Anything else for me, Penny? I don't think Thank so. We, get, we did the key dates. That's yep. really, uh, so I, the, the last thing I would say is watch uh, your mailbox for a survey. Um, watch the Cape Courier for information about the project. And um, within the survey mailer that you should be receiving within the next week or so, a few days, um, you'll, there are information sheets that will align with what you saw in the presentation tonight to kind of refresh your memory as you complete that. So thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>